Last month I visited Japan again for an opening ceremony of a new hospital at Hokkaido. It was Chinese New Year and there were many visitors around. And there is a saying going, the more visitors, the more accidents. That night, right after the party, two patrons were sent to our hospital. Car accident. It was due to the roads being slippery. The car lost control and spun 40 meters across the road and smashed into a tour bus. Luckily, there were no tourists inside or around the bus at the time, but the bus driver had his lower body crushed where the car had smashed. The driver of the car was an old man heading to a wedding ceremony. Information from the police said that he stepped on the brake too suddenly that the rear tire slipped. Very unfortunately, the car driver died immediately. Meanwhile, the bus driver was rushed to do an immediate operation. We needed to observe him and decide whether or not to do another operation some days later when he awoke. We found that the bus driver's family had not arrived and we realized that he was living alone and had no family. The bus driver didn't wake for almost a week. The doctor decided to do another operation since time was limited and they couldn't wait for him to decide. We had to think the best for any patrons. The operation did not go well from the doctor's information. The patient was bleeding badly during the operation and the health condition of him was not so good. The man died that evening, making it the second death in our hospital. That night, when I went to tidy up the patient's room for the next day's use, I saw a person facing the wall, mumbling to the wall. I tried to go and ask him who he was, but I was stopped by a nurse whom had worked at the hospital for years. She pulled me over and told me never to speak to such people. I suddenly realized that the person I saw looked just like the injured bus driver. I may have just experienced the hospital's first ever ghost story. So I recently went on a trip with my family to Japan. Overall I really enjoyed myself and thought it was a beautiful country. But one thing happened to me that kind of puts me off. I decided I was hungry. Seeing a 7-Eleven out my hotel window, I decided to go and get something to eat because it wasn't too much of a walk and there was no room service or anything. So I set off on my small journey to get some food. After buying some kebab things and a strange cake, I went to the small seating area to sit and eat because I was too tired to walk back yet. It was just me and an older Japanese man sitting behind me. I felt someone touching my hair. I turned around. He started trying to tell me how beautiful my hair was, but his English was terrible, so I just smiled and said thank you. This was not uncommon, as I have strawberry blonde hair, and a lot of people in Japan seem to be fascinated with it. People always come up and touched it. I got back to eating, but soon after, the man moved next to me and started trying to talk to me again. To be completely honest, I sort of felt obliged to try and communicate because he seemed so cute and old and innocent. I just wanted to be nice. Bad idea. Shortly after, he starts saying short phrases in English. Incredibly sexual short phrases. His English seemed to have gotten better, and he continued to ask me for sex and tell me I was beautiful and I was very uncomfortable at this point and got up and left the 7-Eleven. At this point he decided it would be really cool and a fun idea to come with me. At this point I just couldn't deal with his I wanted to go back to the hotel and nap. I turned around and began cursing telling him to leave me alone now. All of a sudden he got this very angry look on his face and actually spat on me. I was so furious at this point that I turned around, ignored the pain in my stomach, and walked home so angrily I probably looked like a cartoon character.
A few months back, I decided I was pretty much over the breakup I'd had during the summer with my long-term girlfriend. It took me months to be able to get over it, as I was really heartbroken, but at some point you just sort of have to get back on the horse, don't you? So I downloaded that dating app Hinge and started swiping through profiles. It's definitely the best dating app I've come across, as it lets you actually message girls directly instead of just sort of hoping that they're going to see you and match with you. So it definitely gave me a better chance at getting to talk to the kind of girls I'm into, and and one of these was a Persian girl named Sarushe. Sarushe was honestly one of the most beautiful girls I'd ever laid eyes on. She had this big mess of wild dark hair that was dip-dyed blonde towards the ends, really high cheekbones, perfectly sculptured eyebrows, and some of the deepest, darkest, most alluring brown eyes I'd ever seen. She was simply stunning, and... Because she'd grown up in Tehran, the capital of Iran, I had something of an edge. You see, I speak a little bit of Farsi, the language they speak there, and I figured that might impress her if I told her as much, which it did, and boom. Only an hour or so later, I sent her my opener and we were chatting. She was an extremely busy person, and I was flattered when she said that she would make time to see me. So, we arranged to meet for coffee over the weekend. She showed up to our date in her gym gear and apologized for being so underdressed, but could only make it after a scheduled workout with a personal trainer. But I didn't care at all. She looked absolutely smoking hot in her yoga pants. And we were having coffee, just kind of chatting about our lives, our interests, all that first date kind of stuff, when I look out of the big glass windows to see this dude leaning up against his car. I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me at first, but... After a minute or two, I realized that he was just straight up staring at us. At one point, Sarushe noticed me looking over her shoulder and asked what I'm looking at, and I make a comment about the bloke outside who seemed to be proper eyeballing us. She then turns around, looking over her shoulder, then spins back with this terrified look on her face before saying something like, uh, We have to leave, now. I'm all like, Why? Do you know that fella? And she denies knowing him, but I'm not a dope. I knew what the score was, like straight away. Either it was a controlling family member or something, or it was a psycho ex-boyfriend. I figured all he'd do was follow us to try and be intimidating or something, but I never imagined he'd actually lay hands on me, and the way that he did it absolutely scared the soil out of me. You see, where I live is built up along this big mile-wide river, and the coffee shop me and Surashe had chosen to meet at was right on the docks. So we're walking along the city's promenade when the guy cornered me, grabbed me by the throat, and started pushing me backwards so my back was leaning over the rails. I tried to get him off, but this bloke was an absolute unit, and as much as I tried, there was no getting him off of me. And the thing about the river where I live is that it's got a really, really strong current, like if you fall off of a boat or over the side of the prom, you can be in serious trouble as the current will suck you under the water, drown you, and then just drag you out into the Irish Sea. So the whole time he's threatening me, telling me to leave Surashe alone, all this big macho masculine stuff. Surashe is smacking him around the head, telling him to get off me, and all the while I'm thinking, if I go over the edge here, I'm a dead man. And I don't think he had any idea of it either. Like it didn't sound like he was from our city, as we have a very particular accent, which he just didn't have. So he was probably thinking he could lash me in the water and embarrass me a wee bit, and I'd just be fine, but I'm telling you now, I wouldn't have been, and he'd have been done for manslaughter. But thank God, he didn't throw me over the railings, he just sort of backed off and headed back the way that he'd come after he'd blown off a little bit of steam. <sighs> I mean, the girl was gorgeous. I don't blame him for being a bit sore after a breakup or jealous of another lad, but if he'd been angrier, if he'd have lost his cool, really lost control, I legit wouldn't be here typing this. I'd be floating in the Irish Sea somewhere, maybe washing up as a rotten corpse on the beach in County Cork, all because of some idiot getting a bit jealous. So before this whole lockdown thing happened and my dating life went to hell in a handbasket, I used to swipe through Tinder and Bumble quite a lot, looking for girls to hook up with. 
So I'm bored in my silver-like apartment one day when I come across this absolute smoke show of a girl who was listed under the name Lilith. She had these big green eyes, wore pigtails a lot in her profile pictures, and had absolutely no qualms of showing off this big peachy butt she had. She also had this goth girl vibe going, which was something I find really attractive. I mean, she was definitely not the kind of girl I'd bring home to mom, but that's not really what I'm looking for when I'm swiping, so naturally, I swipe right. Boom. We match. I think I actually let out this involuntary, no way, when the old it's a match text appeared, and kind of cynically told myself, nah, she's a bot, this isn't real. But yup. It was real, and she was so cute to talk to. At first, anyway, because things started to go a little different when we actually met up. She worked at this coffee shop at the Getty and asked me if I wanted to pick her up after her shift so she could take me somewhere real special, which turned out to be the Museum of Death on Hollywood Boulevard. I mean, not my ideally romantic place to go on a first date, but like I said... She was a slam piece, and it was basically impossible to say no to her. So it was decided, and after I picked her up, she kept it the mystery for a while, only telling me to drive her to Hollywood Boulevard before revealing where she actually wanted to go. The area around the museum is kind of sketchy, but again, I'd have driven through way worse neighborhoods for a date with this girl, so I just pushed all my concerns to the back of my mind. Despite the interior being as dark and dingy as it was, looking like an over-clustered basement, the whole thing was actually kind of interesting at first. But I'd be lying if I said my eyes stayed on the exhibits the whole time, when they were pretty much glued to her butt whenever I wasn't going to get caught looking. It most definitely wasn't particularly creepy either, but the things that Lilith started to say to me as we were walking around the place did in a big, bad way too. Like I said, the exhibits were interesting, but that's all they were aside from being gross and spooky. There were death masks, body parts preserved in formaldehyde, all the things you might come to expect from a place called the Museum of Death, and then some. But this Lilith chick starts saying how pretty some of this stuff is, looking at it the way any other girl might look at a picture of a puppy or something. She then starts asking me all these weird questions about how I'd like to die. Yeah how I'd like to die. I tell her I wouldn't like to die at all. I mean, it was legit the creepiest question I think I'd ever been asked, and she insists that everyone has a way they'd most want to die. I don't want to screw up the date or anything. She seemed crazy, and crazy girls can be real fun, if you catch my meaning, so I give her some throwaway response, like, whatever way is most pain-free. She starts telling me how that was a boring answer and how she'd like to die of hypothermia because it apparently makes you feel all warm and sleepy towards the end. How some victims of hypothermia have even taken their clothes off before they died and just laid down in the snow or whatever before their heart stops beating. She also then gave me this long in-depth speech about how taking another person's life would be better than even getting intimate to catch my drift how that feeling of pure power must dwarf any feeling that drugs or alcohol have to offer. She then tells me how hot she thought it would be to watch me drown at the bottom of a pool while there's an audience, and how it had actually turned her on to see my final moments of desperation before my body went limp and floated around the tank. Then something about how the Vikings would make wings out of the skin on a person's back by peeling it off and spreading it out, calling it beautiful, how it was like art or something. When she's done telling me all of that, and I'm suitably freaked out, she starts calling me Pet, and how she wanted me chained up at the end of her bed so she could do whatever she wanted with me. Now, any other girl, I'd think that was incredibly kinky, but after what Lilith had just talked about, I really didn't think what she had in mind for me involved any kind of pleasure whatsoever. When it came to driving her home, she actually told me to stop a few blocks away from her house because she didn't want me to know exactly where it was that she lived at, saying that you couldn't be too careful these days with all the psychos in the world who use dating apps. Yep, she said that to me after she'd spent like an hour talking about all the ways she'd want to die or how she'd watch me die. As soon as I got home, I blocked her number. 
I've never been more scared of anyone like that before, let alone a girl I wanted to hook up with. So, Lilith, if you're reading this, let's not meet again. The following stories are based on real events and were obtained from interviews conducted by Unit 522 and Tim Sonsky. Some names and identifying details have been changed to protect the privacy of the individuals involved. These stories will contain disturbing content. Viewer discretion is advised. This isn't a traditional creepy story where something unexplainable or horrible happened to me, but rather, what almost happened to me. What I almost became. Back in the early 1990s, I was in my late teens, and without question what could be described as a bad seed. My friends and I were just simply horrible people. We would throw rocks at stray cats and passing cars, bully younger kids and steal bicycles to take them on joy rides, where most of the time we would just leave them in the gully in the woods when we got bored with them. My parents tried to discipline me, but it never really stuck, and most of the time, they found it easier just to have me out of the house. I was an appalling kid, really. I cursed at my parents and teachers, talked back to the cops, and never used to feel sorry for anyone unless it was me. One night, my friend and I were smoking cigarettes on his back porch, and when his dad went to bed, my friend darted into the garage and returned with an old-fashioned handgun. I picked it up with both hands and started pointing it every which way, without a care in the world. He told me his dad had bought it a week ago off the street, and when he confirmed that it was loaded, the very first thing that entered my mind was, Hey, we should go rob someone. I hid the gun in my waistband and walked down the street with my friend to the end of the cul-de-sac where we knew an old woman lived alone. We had no idea what exactly we wanted to rob from her. We just knew that she would be an easy target. We snuck around the back of the house and walked up onto her back porch, and I was able to force the locked door open just by putting my weight against it and jiggling the knob hard back and forth. As soon as the door was open, and the domestic old person smell from inside the house wafted over us, my friend lost his nerve and bolted away. He literally just said, I changed my mind, and took off running. I walked right into the house without him, determined not just to take something, but I wanted to scare the woman as well. I walked through the kitchen and into the living room, where the old woman was sleeping on the couch. The TV was on, and the volume was turned down. I pointed my gun at her face. But after a moment when she didn't open her eyes, I felt disappointed, and I walked around behind the couch. I held the barrel of the gun less than an inch away from her head, and in that moment, from the back of my mind, I kept hearing a voice whispering to me, You can kill her. Do it. Having a weapon in my hand gave me an incredible feeling of power. I didn't have any intention of actually hurting the woman, but now that I was here, it seemed like the obvious thing to do. Without pausing to think, my fingers squeezed the trigger, but nothing happened. The safety was on, and the trigger was locked. Suddenly the weight of what I nearly did hit me like a ton of bricks. I started shaking and immediately lowered the gun. I power walked out of the living room across the kitchen into the back door. When I reached it, I paused, turned around, and saw the woman's eyes were open. She was looking right at me. There were tears in her eyes and a look of terror on her face. Her fear immediately made me start tearing up. I ran back home gave the gun to my parents, and confessed that I had nearly done something really bad. They called the police, and I confessed to having broken into an old woman's house with a gun. I didn't tell them about attempting to pull the trigger. I didn't tell them about my friend or where I got the gun either. I had to spend some time in juvenile hall for breaking and entering. But honestly, that was the best thing that could have happened to me. I'll never forget that night. I was on the path of self-destruction and I very nearly crossed a line that would have ruined my life forever. It makes me sick, knowing exactly how close I came. I have never touched a gun since, and fortunately I managed to turn my life around. Please use this as a cautionary tale. All it takes is one deceptive thought, 
at the wrong moment, and you could destroy your future. Please everyone, be smarter than I was. Back in the late 90s, I used to have a serious drug problem. I was living in Las Vegas at the time, and after snorting my entire stash of coke, I would party, pass out, wake up, jack some cars, sell them, spend some money on food, and the rest would go to my dealer, and then I would snort again and repeat the entire process. One night in July, I broke into a panel van without windows. It was parked alone outside of a rat-infested motel. My gut told me that I should check the back before I drove away, but my mind was on my next fix, and I just floored it as soon as I got the engine started. I drove about an hour away into an isolated area of the desert, where I would meet my contact, who would check out the car, pay me in cash, and then drop me off at the nearest street corner. Once I put the van in park, I decided to check out the back. I figured there might be some tools or something back there that I could pawn for more cash. The back of the van was padlocked shut, which should have been my first clue, because when I smashed it open with my crowbar, I heard a high-pitched wailing from inside. I turned on my flashlight, and my stomach dropped. Four Hispanic children, two boys and two girls, were tied up and gagged, lying on a handful of filthy cushions. I dropped the crowbar and backed away from the van a few steps. This was bad really fucking bad. I didn't know what to do. I had clearly stolen the van from a kidnapper or a human trafficker and they would be looking to recover it and likely shoot the asshole who took it from them. I decided not to call my contact. I knew him pretty well and I was fairly certain that he would either kill the kids and dump their bodies in the desert or shoot me for fucking this up. I made a snap decision. I climbed in the van and explained to them in both English and what Spanish I knew that I wasn't going to hurt them. I engagged them and cut the bonds around their wrists, but I left their ankles tied. I couldn't risk them running off. I felt sick to my stomach with heartbroken guilt when I saw the welts around their hands. The stench of urine and sweat was heavy in the air. I climbed back in the driver's seat, drove back out of the desert, and at the first service stop I pulled in and parked. I went inside and bought four bottles of water and as many bags of snacks that I could afford. I carefully opened the back of the van and tossed the bag inside. Then I closed it again and walked across the lot. I made an anonymous phone call to the police from a payphone and then walked to the next service station where I had a friend come pick me up. After that night, I had my friend buy me a bus ticket to Texas where I had an older brother who would let me stay on his couch. I got clean and I ultimately turned my life around. I got an honest job and I now have my own family and my own home. I remember being so relieved when I heard on the news that the kids had been found and were returned to their families in Mexico. You never know when life will give you a test like that and a chance to prove your character. I like to think that those kids helped me as much as I helped them. In 2011, on my 21st birthday, I took it upon myself to go backpacking through the Canadian mountains all on my own. I had gone backpacking and camping many times before, but never on my own. I wanted this birthday significance to be rooted in the fact that I had challenged the great outdoors all on my own. On my third day out, I reached my destination. It was an old farmhouse sitting on its own in an overgrown field out in the middle of nowhere. I had discovered it on Google Earth and was eager to check it out before heading back. In addition to a first aid kit, a compass, and a utility knife, I was carrying a Smith & Wesson Governor revolver, which carried six shots. It was the crown jewel of my father's collection, and he had loaned it to me for protection while I was out in the woods alone. He made sure that I had practiced with it several times and knew how to use it before I set off. And now, as I approached the farmhouse, I was pleased that I had taken the time, because I wasn't entirely sure the place was abandoned. Every window on the ground floor was boarded up, and a faded plastic pinwheel spun lazily from where it was stuffed into the dirt by the front door. I walked right up the front steps, and feeling somewhat foolish, I knocked. When no one answered, I walked around the perimeter of the house, 
There was an ancient rusty fire escape hanging down from one of the upstairs windows, and an old single door refrigerator lying on its side out amongst the tall grass. When I walked back around to the front door of the house again, I tried the knob. It was rusty, but I managed to turn it with both hands, and the door swung open with a creak. I was just about to walk in, when I felt the sensation of eyes on me, and I spun around. Out by the tree line, I saw what appeared to be a man with a long gray beard staring at me. I immediately felt foolish and guilty, and waved at him, my other hand reaching into my belt to rest on the handle of the gun. Hi there. Is this your place? I'm sorry. I'll leave. For maybe ten seconds, the man just stared at me. Then, without saying anything, he turned and walked back into the trees. That made me nervous. I didn't know how to interpret it, and the last thing I wanted to do was walk back into the woods knowing that he was out there. I decided to enter the house and close the door behind me. I slid a dusty stool in front of the door, so I would hear it tip over if anyone entered. I spent the next hour exploring the house, occasionally glancing out of the windows to see if the man had reappeared. When it finally began getting dark out, I was still nervous and unwilling to leave the house, so I walked up a narrow flight of stairs to the attic, locked the door behind me, set up my gas lantern, and unrolled my sleeping bag. After a light dinner, I updated my journal, turned off the light, and prepared to get some sleep. But after a minute or so, I heard creaking on the stairs, and my eyes shot open. I looked over towards the door, and I heard the faint sound of footsteps climbing the narrow staircase. I threw myself out of the sleeping bag, grabbed my flashlight and my gun, and pointed them both towards the door. I called out, Who's there? If I'm trespassing, I'm sorry. I'll pack up and leave. Just don't try to open the door. I have a gun. The footsteps continued to climb without hesitation. When they were just outside the door, I heard the doorknob rattle. I made my voice sound as furious as I could. Don't try to get in. I told you I have a gun. Just tell me who you are. There was a moment of hesitation, and then the doorknob began to jiggle harder. Stop it! I'll fucking shoot! I made myself count to five, but the doorknob continued to jiggle violently. Last chance! I made myself count to five again, and when the jiggling didn't stop, I fired two shots through the door, aiming low, intending to hit the stranger's legs. As soon as the shots rang out, the knob stopped jiggling, and there was silence. There was no sound of anyone falling backwards down the steps or a gasp in pain. There was just silence. I kept the gun up and cautiously walked towards the door. I unlocked it and opened it. I nearly shat myself when I saw there was nothing standing there. There was no blood, no body, no indication that anyone had been standing there. I slammed the door, locked it again, and dragged an ancient rusty armchair in front of the door to block it. For the next several hours, I would doze off for a while and then wake up again, keeping my gun nearby until the sun rose. After it was light enough, I gathered my belongings and crawled out of the window and went down the fire escape. But when I was about 20 steps away from the house, I turned, and looking back at me from the attic window was the bearded old man. I drew my gun and aimed it at him but I didn't shoot. I did it as a warning not to follow me. Then I sprinted back into the woods. Two years later, in the summer of 2013, I returned to the house with four of my friends and showed them all the bullet holes in the attic door. I still go camping every now and then, but I always make sure I bring my handgun because you never know who might be watching you from the shadows. Last Thanksgiving, my boyfriend and I loaded our two-month-old daughter into our car and drove from Miami to Naples to visit my family. Being new parents, we were extremely nervous about taking such a lengthy trip with the baby and packed for every possible scenario. We left shortly after 12, my boyfriend behind the wheel, and we hit the highway, which was swollen with holiday traffic. 
After about an hour of driving, the baby became fussy, and we pulled over at a rest stop to feed her and change her diaper. While I was changing her, my boyfriend stood outside the car stretching, and suddenly called my name. Peering outside the car, I looked across the street in the direction he was pointing. There was a clown with a purple star painted over his face, and wild, crazy, unkept black hair, and a purple and white checkered outfit standing on the opposite side of the parking lot, just waving to people as they pulled in and out of the rest stop. I chuckled and returned to what I was doing, unbothered by the clown, figuring it was just part of some kind of promotion. As we pulled out of the station, the clown waved at us, and I gave a lazy acknowledgement back. Just before my boyfriend took his foot off the brake and eased into traffic, the clown gave me the most hungry, sinister smile I had ever seen and shouted, You would look amazing draped over my lap. Even through the closed car window, I heard him clearly and said, Wow, what a creep. As we drove away, I repeated what the clown had said to my boyfriend, who hadn't quite heard it, and for a few minutes he was dead set on turning around to confront him. But I told him it wasn't worth it, as we still had a long drive ahead of us. We arrived in Naples shortly after 2.30, and by then, I had already forgotten about the incident and didn't even bring it up to my parents. We had a great time at my parents' place and ended up leaving close to 11.30 at night, much later than we had intended to. My parents tried to convince us to stay, and while we had plenty of stuff for the baby, we hadn't packed any overnight things for ourselves. So we decided just to commit to the drive. We figured that there would be a lot less traffic and it would take a shorter amount of time to get home. My boyfriend had been driving for about 45 minutes when he asked me if I wouldn't mind taking over, as he was having a hard time keeping his eyes focused. I told him to pull over at the next rest area, and I would take the wheel. After a few minutes, we see a sign for a rest area and pull into it. It wasn't the same rest stop as before. It had no bathrooms, vending machines, or anything. It was basically just a long parking lot, with one row of parking spaces which looped back onto the road. My boyfriend pulled the car into a spot, nose first, so it was facing a long chain link fence, and beyond it, there was just trees and a swamp. I couldn't see anything specific in the glow of the headlights. He put the car in park and left the engine running, and the lights on as he climbed out of the driver's seat. The baby started to fuss as soon as the car stopped moving, and after I climbed out of the passenger seat, I opened the back door to check on her. My boyfriend climbed into the passenger seat and immediately shut his eyes. After I confirmed that the baby was fine and would probably fall back asleep when we started driving again, I shut the back door and made my way to the driver's seat. That's when I heard the sound of the chain link fence rattling and something being dragged across the metal links, steadily drawing closer. I turned in the direction of the noise and for a split second, I only noticed the dark outline of a figure on the opposite side of the fence, until they stepped into the light of our headlights. It was the exact same clown from the other rest stop. Except this time he had a large red stain splattered across his purple and white costume, and was dragging a broken beer bottle across the fence. He pressed his face directly in the fence and smiled at me. He cackled. <laughs> Hello again and started making lewd gestures with his tongue. I was at a loss for words. It was so unbelievably surreal that I could only stare at him in disbelief and horror, not knowing whether I should be truly afraid or start laughing at the absurdity of it. My boyfriend launched himself out of the passenger seat and screamed, Get in the car! When he opened his car door, the baby started crying out and the sound could be heard across the silent parking lot and the clown immediately started singing in a grotesque, uneven voice. rock a bye baby in the treetop. When the clown comes, the cradle will rock. My parents had given us a set of fancy glasses for our dining room table. My boyfriend launched one directly at the clown. The glass shattered against the chain link fence and sprayed tiny razor projectiles all over. The clown hissed and immediately booked it to the end of the fence. My boyfriend and I jumped into the car, slammed the doors, and locked them. I threw the car into reverse and backed out of the spot, and as we put the car in drive, we saw the clown charging towards us across the parking lot. My boyfriend yelled at me to hit him, 
but I swerved to avoid him and floored it out of the lot and back onto the highway. For the next several minutes, my heart was racing, convinced that at any moment a speeding car would come up behind us and try to run us off the road, but fortunately that never happened. We were so shaken and traumatized that all we could do for the rest of the way home was ask each other over and over again, what the heck just happened? We could only speculate what the guy was doing out there at 12 a.m., dressed like a clown in the middle of the Everglades on Thanksgiving night. We considered that he was just trying to mess with people, but you would need some serious balls to pull that kind of stunt out there in the Everglades. The people that live around there don't put up with that kind of nonsense. And what was he even doing there? Just hiding behind the dark fence for a completely random car to show up so he could traumatize them? I don't know if the stain on his suit was actually blood, but he made us feel threatened enough that we felt justified throwing something at him. And seeing as how his response was to charge us, I suspect that his intentions were hostile. The fact that we had seen him earlier that day made the situation even worse, because it felt like he was stalking us. My boyfriend had a license to carry a gun, so all I can say is, it's a good thing that he wasn't packing that particular night. This Thanksgiving, we plan to stay home. I know when most people think of a female clown, they immediately think of the charismatic and very sexy Batman villain Harley Quinn, but I promise they're not all like that. Back in 2012, I was walking home one night, at around 9. I live in Gilbert, Arizona, and was walking by a large, wide-open park with a couple of soccer fields and basketball courts when I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. The overhead lights were still on and illuminating the fields, and I noticed someone sitting cross-legged out on the grass. I pulled out my earbuds and stepped off the sidewalk to get a closer look. At first, I thought maybe it was someone who had hurt themselves, but as I took a few steps closer, I noticed that it was a young woman, perhaps in her early 20s, leaning forward over something. It was hard to tell her exact age because her face was covered in white makeup and a red heart and a black spade painted on her cheeks. Her top lip was painted black and her bottom lip dark red. She was wearing a gray hoodie with the hood up, but had two holes cut on either side to accommodate her blonde pigtails. I stopped in my tracks and glanced around convinced that this was a YouTube prank or something. But we were in the middle of a wide open area, and aside from the occasional car passing by, we seemed completely alone. The clown lady was wearing bright red sneakers, torn jeans, and some kind of clawed glove on her right hand like Freddy Krueger. I was only a dozen feet or so away, close enough to say something, but I decided to back away slowly and not engage in whatever she was doing. As I took a step back, she called out to me without looking up. Where are you going? Come here! Nah, I'm good. I replied and continued to walk away. For the first time, she looked up and smiled way too big, showcasing far more teeth and gums than was necessary. She raised the clawed hand, and I noticed that at the ends of each fingertip was a sharp point, like a thumbtack. You sure? More for me then. <laughs> That's when she pulled out a large kitchen knife, the size of an ear of corn, and started cutting into the thing on the ground. I glanced back down and noticed the thing that she was leaning over appeared to be a dead bird of some kind, and she was using her clawed hand to pull the feathers off. She stabbed at the bird with the blade, and then pulled out a flask out of her pocket and threw back a swig. I nearly fell backwards into the road as I maneuvered myself off the grass and onto the sidewalk. I didn't want to turn my back on her the whole time, convinced that it was a prank and I should start looking around in every direction for someone with a camera or a phone, but there was no one else even remotely close by and no place they could be hiding either. I quickly turned around and power walked down the sidewalk towards my apartment complex. As I reached the intersection, I was forced to wait for the traffic light to change so I could cross safely. My earbuds were back in, but I honestly wasn't listening to the music. I was so confused and unnerved by what I had just seen. I glanced over my shoulder and saw to my horror that the lady clown was walking up the sidewalk towards me, appearing to be looking directly at me. 
I wrenched out my earbuds again, glanced both ways, up and down the street, and even though the light was still green and the cars had the right of way, I sprinted across. When I reached the other side, I turned and saw that she was still approaching the intersection. She waved at me with her clawed hand, and a few feathers fluttered to the ground. She called out to me. Don't get killed tonight. At least I'm pretty sure that's what she said. There were sounds of traffic muffling her voice. I literally ran home, entered my gated apartment complex, and went the long way around the building just to make sure I wasn't being followed. I then climbed up the stairs, locked both of my locks, and stared out my peephole in a panic. For about five minutes before I finally calmed down, I didn't turn on any lights in the apartment and instead used my phone to navigate to my bedroom and then used the light from my laptop screen to change and go to bed. The following day, when the sun was high in the sky, I double-checked the spot where the clown lady had been, and the mutilated remains of a bird were lying on the grass. A few weeks later, I saw her again in broad daylight. I was driving my friend's car and noticed her walking down the sidewalk in full makeup in the exact same hoodie, dragging a garbage bag behind her. I turned the car around out of morbid curiosity and followed her for about a half mile pulling over on the side of the road to let her walk ahead for a while and slowly continuing on. When she reached a wide open plot of dirt, I saw her pull out what looked like to be a dead rat from the garbage bag. She cut it open with a switchblade and wrung it out like a sponge, blood spilling onto the ground and probably all over her clothes as well. That's when she turned towards me and with blood running down her fingers, raised her right hand and put her thumb between her index finger and middle finger. This is known as giving someone the fig, and if anything, it's even more obscene than raising your middle finger. I immediately backed the car up and got the hell out of there. It's not that when she turned towards me that bothered me, she easily could have realized that she was being followed. It was the gesture she gave me. It's one I commonly use at people in traffic, and I always get a kick out of it because hardly anyone knows what that means but I've never seen anyone else use it in my life. And the fact that she did really shook me. I mean, what are the chances she knew that I would understand it? I've since moved, but my buddy still lives out there and occasionally tells me he spots her wandering the side of the road. So next time you're in Gilbert, keep an eye out. This happened when I was about 14. I had just started babysitting for this family in my neighborhood. They had two kids, a boy who was 10 at the time and a girl who at the time was 8. They were great kids to babysit. They got along with each other without fighting and always did what I asked of them without complaining. Before I launch into what happened, I'm going to give you all some background information about this family's house so you can understand why I was so freaked out. The house is situated pretty far back in my neighborhood on this little side street off of the main road that runs the neighborhood. The house is in a cul-de-sac, so there's not a lot of traffic on this road at all. Usually, the only people that ever come into the cul-de-sac are the mailman and people who lived in the other three houses that were in the cul-de-sac. The street itself was not very long at all, so there were only three houses on each side of the street that weren't in the cul-de-sac. Essentially, despite being in a large neighborhood, the street that this house was situated on was very quiet, and if you didn't live in the neighborhood, you might not know that the street existed. It was a fall Friday night, I'm pretty sure it was late November right after Thanksgiving, and I had arrived at the house around 6pm. The kids were already sitting down eating dinner when I got there, and the parents told me that they expected to be home around midnight or so. The parents also made a joke about how the kids had the whole street to themselves since the other families that lived there were out of town for Thanksgiving. The parents left, the kids finished eating, and we went outside to play in the cul-de-sac. I remember locking the front door and taking the house key outside with me. The kids rode around on their scooters for about an hour. For some reason, I just felt really on edge while the kids were playing outside. I chalked this feeling up to knowing that we were alone on the street since everyone else was out of town. After the kids finished playing outside, we went inside to play Wii in the basement. I remember locking the front door once we were back inside and putting the key on the kitchen counter. 
I then checked the front door before I went downstairs to the basement. I was super vigilant about checking the doors because I had watched so many scary movies where the babysitter forgets to lock the door and then some crazy murderer gets into the house, blah blah blah. As the kids are playing in the basement, I get that unsettling feeling again. I didn't feel like we were being watched. It was more like when you know that something is going to pop out in a scary movie and you're just anticipating it on the edge of your seat, with tension at its highest. The feeling sticks with me the entire time that we're in the basement, but again, I chalk it up to the knowing that the entire street is empty. The clock strikes 10 and it's time for the kids to head to bed. We go to the top floor of the house where the kids' bedrooms are. The house is set up so that when you open the front door of the house and come inside, you're standing in the foyer with the steps to go to the top floor directly in front of you. If you're standing in the foyer, you can see all the way up the stairs into the bathroom and on the top floor. So the kids are in the bathroom brushing their teeth and we all hear a car pull into their driveway. I figured that it's their parents coming home super early and I expect to hear the garage door start opening, but that sound never comes. I walk into the girl's bedroom and look out her front window. There's a car running in the driveway and there's a man in the car, but the headlights are turned off despite it being 10pm and it's pitch black dark outside. I figured it was someone who just got lost in our neighborhood and was just using the driveway to stop and get their bearings before heading back out on the road. I leave the girl's bedroom and head back to the bathroom where the kids are. Suddenly, I hear a knock on the front door. I turn around and there's a man standing at their door holding a pizza box. There are two long windows on either side of their front door, so I have a clear view of this guy, and I know that he has a clear view of us. I immediately get that eerie feeling that I had been feeling all night. I asked both of the kids if they ordered a pizza for some reason, and they both said no. These kids were always very honest and wouldn't lie about something like that or even order a pizza without asking me, so I knew they were being truthful. Normally I would have gone downstairs to see what this guy wanted. Maybe he had the wrong house and I could point him in the right direction, but that little voice in my head was screaming, don't go downstairs, do not open that door. The guy also looked like he didn't work for any pizza company. Normally they would be wearing a uniform or a hat with the company's logo on it, or something. This guy just seemed off. He looked like he was in his late 30s, maybe early 40s, and looked super disheveled. His shirt was really wrinkled. His pants were filthy and ripped, and he had this ratty black baseball cap that was pulled down super far so that his eyes were covered. He was also grinning really aggressively like I thought this guy's teeth would just shatter because of how hard he was pressing them together. At this point, the kids notice him and start asking why he's here. Should we open the door, etc, etc. I tell them no, and ask that they just go to their rooms and lie down. The boy goes to his room, and I walk the girl into her room and look out the window at the car again. I notice that the car doesn't have one of those pizza delivery car signs on the top which all of the pizza companies in my town require delivery drivers to have. So now I feel really confident in my initial intuition that this guy isn't a legit pizza delivery guy. The girl gets in bed, and I come back out of her room and sit down at the top of the stairs so that I can keep an eye on this guy. I tried to stay really calm so as not to upset the kids, even though I was flipping out on the inside. He's still standing at the door holding the pizza box in one hand, and he's still grinning that teeth-shattering grin. His mouth was almost too big for his face, I thought. Even though I can't see his eyes because of the hat, I know that he's dead-ass staring at me. Then, without breaking eye contact, he starts jiggling the door handle pretty aggressively while still grinning. I silently thank God that I was so psychotic about making sure the front door was locked. He stops jiggling the handle and resumes staring at me. If I was in this situation now, I probably would have called the police immediately, but being only 14 and fairly new to babysitting, I was paralyzed with fear. I felt like if I took my eyes off of him for a second, when I looked back, he would be standing at the base of the stairs. After about another five minutes of the stare down, he literally starts walking backwards off of the porch without breaking eye contact. 
Legit, this dude is walking backwards towards his car while still staring at me. I go into the parents' bedroom, which also has a view of the driveway, kneel down in front of the window and peek out. I'm expecting to see this guy getting into his car. Nope. The guy is nowhere in sight, but the car is still there. So I return to my perch at the top of the stairs, half expecting to see him at the door again, or worse, standing at the bottom of the stairs. But he was nowhere to be seen. After about 20 minutes, I hear a car starting. I run back to the parents' room, kneel in front of the window again, and notice that the car in the driveway has started, and the guy is sitting in the driver's seat, still fucking grinning. He also doesn't turn the headlights on. He shifts into reverse and begins slowly backing out of the driveway, grinning the entire time. Right before he drives off, he turns his head and I swear to God makes direct eye contact with me again. And again, I can't see his eyes because of the hat, but I know that he was looking directly at me. This is really disturbing to me since he didn't really know where I was in the house. The parents' bedroom is in the farthest window to the right if you're looking at the house from outside. The lights in the parents' bedroom are off, and I'm kneeling down. So really, the only part of me that might potentially be visible is the top of my head, my eyes, and my nose. But it's also pitch black outside. He doesn't have his headlights on, and it's pitch black in the parents' bedroom, so I doubt that I was really visible. He also didn't spend time scanning the windows, his head literally just snapped to where I was. It was like he could sense that I was looking at him. After I had time to calm down and collect myself, I started replaying what had just happened and came to the following conclusions. This guy was not a pizza delivery guy. He had no uniform, looked and acted like he was possessed or something, and his car was unmarked. Those 20 minutes or so that elapsed between when he walked backwards off of the porch to when he got into the car were probably spent walking around the house and checking all of the doors, trying to gain entry. He had malicious intent. Maybe he wanted to rob the house. Maybe he wanted to do something more sinister to me or the kids. Either way, this guy was bad news, and I'm glad I trusted the voice in my head. I think he probably found some pizza box and tried to pose as a pizza delivery guy to get me to open the door for him so that he could strike. There are still some parts of the story that are confusing me. If he really wanted to get inside the house, why didn't he find a rock, a brick, or something else to throw through the window? I mean, I'm very glad that he didn't, but I just thought it was a bit odd that he checked the doorknobs and then gave up after he discovered that they were all locked. Maybe he felt like doing something that made a lot of noise that would alert me, and so he could try to sneak in in a more subtle way to catch me off guard. Why did he walk backwards off the porch? Was it just to preserve eye contact and thus intimidate me? Or was this dude just insane? Why did I feel so unsettled early on in the evening before this guy even showed up? Was he watching the house and waiting for the kids to go to bed and for me to be off guard before trying to get into the house? How did he know where to look when he was backing out of the driveway? Why was he grinning the entire time? Did he know that our house was the only house on the street that was inhabited at that time? Why did he pick that house, especially given the fact that it's on a very quiet and secluded street and you have to drive pretty far to the back of the neighborhood to even reach the street? He could have picked the 50 or other so houses that you have to pass to even get to that house. The town where I live is upper middle class and has a super low crime rate and drugs aren't really an issue. We're also surrounded by other similar upper middle class areas so I'm doubtful that this person was on drugs or some crazy vagrant. Of course, I could be wrong. Maybe this dude was just jacked up on drugs. Maybe he was just a vagrant dude. Maybe he really was just a lost pizza delivery man with some unsettling personal quirks. But I'm really doubtful. I attend a college that is located in one of the poorest cities in Northern California. The campus is relatively safe since the school employs its own department of public safety, but after the sun sets it's usually a good call to remain indoors because that's when the townies come out and they tend to wander into campus. 
About two years ago, I was living in an apartment complex in the main part of campus, and I still didn't have a car yet. It was the end of the fall semester, and I was the last person in my apartment of three girls to finish taking finals, so I was home alone since my roommates had already gone home for winter break. I got back from taking my last exam and followed my usual routine of dejectedly collapsing into bed to cry and sleep off the effects of pulling an all-nighter. When I finally woke up, it was already past 10 p.m. and I was starving. Unfortunately, the student grocery store and cafeteria were closed for the day and I had nothing in the apartment to eat and no car to get food elsewhere. I was woefully poking around the fridge in the hopes that I would find something substantial to tide me over until morning when I noticed a Domino's coupon that someone had stuck to the freezer. My stomach's pathetic cries for sustenance had been answered. I quickly decided that there was no shame in ordering a whole pizza plus Cinestics for myself because one, I was ravenous and two, the completion of finals demanded some sort of celebration and three, if anyone happened to ask I was going to lie and say I was sharing it with a friend or something along those lines. Anyway, I eagerly ordered and provided the cashier with my address, apartment, and cell number. I typically never give out my number to anyone, but I had ordered delivery from Domino's in the past, and I knew that they needed my number to call me once more when they were outside because the drivers always got lost navigating through campus. About 20 minutes later, I got the call. My food was here. For reference, it's now close to midnight and the campus was pretty much dead since most students had gone home. The driver told me that he had parked in front of a dorm building that was right across the street from my apartment. I hustled out of my apartment and was going down the stairs when I spotted the delivery guy waiting outside of his car with my pizza. At this point, my sense of caution kicked in and I slowed my pace as my brain took in the fact that there were no other students out, the lighting was bad, and I was essentially walking up to a stranger in his car that still had his engine running. As I neared the bottom of the steps, I silently hoped that he would cross the street and approach me so that I wouldn't have to get near the car. Of course, that didn't happen. I made my way across the street and was finally able to get a good look at him. He was a relatively short Hispanic guy, maybe 5'7 to 5'9, in his early 20s, and my nerves were getting bombarded by the creeper vibes he was giving off. I can only compare it to the vibe that you get when you're out clubbing and you suddenly spot the guy lurking in the crowd sporting the slicked back ponytail, sunglasses, oversized shirt, and sagged pants combo who just so happens to be headed in your direction. I did my best to appear calm and keep the mood light and friendly. He made some comments about how late it was and how no one was around, but I just signed the receipt as quickly as possible, gave him my thanks and an awkward smile, and hightailed it out of there as soon as he handed me my food. I could feel him watching me as I climbed the stairs back to my place. Once I got back into my apartment, I locked and chained up the door and sat down on the living room couch to calm myself. After a few moments, I shrugged off the situation and reasoned that it was just my paranoia and overactive imagination acting up again. I had just turned on the television and was about to take my first bite of pizza when I got a text from an unknown number. It read, You're hella sexy. I connected the dots and matched the text number to the call I had received earlier from the pizza delivery guy. My initial reaction of course was shock since nothing like this has ever happened to me before, but that eventually melted away into laughter and disbelief when I considered my appearance at the time. Like I had mentioned earlier, I had just woken up from my nap after taking my last final. I was wearing a pair of raggedy sweatpants and loose sweatshirt and my hair was nappy and tied into a messy ponytail. My face was probably greasier than the pizza I was eating, and to top it off, I had my glasses on. Definitely not a pretty picture, much less anything that could even come close to resembling hella sexy. The next morning I got a call from my boyfriend John, and I casually told him about the pizza delivery driver, who casually signed his name in the text as Fildo, and the events that had transpired the previous evening. After sheepishly trying to defend my actions on the basis of poor judgment caused by extreme hunger and promising never to do that type of thing again, John convinced me that I should report it to the campus police as a precautionary measure. I gave them a call, and an officer stopped by my apartment a few hours later. I relayed my story, 
He took some pictures of the text message and he wrote down Fildo's phone number. The officer then told me that he would contact the Dominoes if I wanted him to, but that it would most likely result in Fildo's termination. I was still relatively unfazed by the whole situation and I told the officer I just wanted to make sure that this creep never did this to any other girls on campus, but at the same time I didn't want him to lose his job. The officer then started asking me questions about how I felt after my encounter. Questions along the lines of, do you feel threatened by Fildo? Do you feel safe in your apartment with the knowledge that Fildo has both your phone number and your exact address? If I wasn't scared before, I definitely was now and during the course of my questioning, I had broken out in a cold sweat and my traitorous imagination began conjuring up all sorts of dastardly situations that ended in my untimely demise. Obviously, I ended up giving the officer the go-ahead to pursue my case and contact the Dominoes. About a month later, while I was at home celebrating the holidays, I got a call from my boyfriend. I had left him the keys to my apartment so that he could store his bike there and crash in my room while I was away. He told me that he had stopped by my place, but that he couldn't get in because the keys weren't working. He also said that it looked like someone had broken in because there was some glass in the floor and a wooden board across my living room window. I was pretty upset because this was my first time hearing about it, so I called the school the next day to figure out what the hell had happened. Housing transferred my call to the public safety department, and the officer I spoke with was only able to tell me that, according to their records, a maintenance worker had called them two days after I had headed home to report my broken window. Public safety had responded by boarding up the window and changing the lock when they noticed it had been tampered with. I convinced the officer to let my boyfriend into the apartment so he could go check and see if anything was stolen, and thankfully, nothing was. My gut tells me that it was Fildo who did it. It was Fildo who tried to pick my lock and then broke my window. It scares me even more now when I consider the fact that nothing had been stolen. My flat screen TV was right by the window that had been broken and my boyfriend's fancy road bike was sitting right there in the living room. Why didn't he steal anything? Does that mean his intentions were to break in and get his revenge on me, the girl that had cost him his job? Would this still have happened if I had not given the officer permission to pursue the case? I try not to spend too much time speculating about what Fildo's true intentions were, but when I do, it still makes my heart race when I think about what could have happened if I'd still been in my apartment at the time. I'm a 22 year old female that weighs 80 pounds and that's athletic. I'm quite tall and have a defect in my eyes so one's grey and one's green. I promise that'll be relevant later. So this happened when I was 20 and it stopped when I was 21. Many things have happened to me for some reason. I guess I'm just a magnet for weirdness. I met this guy in university when he was finishing and I was just starting. He was assigned my study partner. I'm studying to be a pediatrician. I remember that he was quite nice in the beginning but started to get jealous whenever I spent time with my boyfriend. This was the first red flag that... Whenever I went, I always kind of saw him walking some meters behind me. And then the notes started. There were really sexual notes about me and other things I'm not so sure I should share. After that, I didn't know who it was, but at the end, it was about 255 notes, all in one month. The last one actually had names, so I went straight to the office and reported him. I ended up with a different partner. The day that I had to tell them that I had gotten a different partner, I was kind of about to lose it and sweating bullets. The face he made was a pure anger. He started to yell racial slurs at me. I'm a quarter Latin and German. About how I was a Nazi, that I was a psycho, and he went on and on. And now a tip for people like me, just walk away. And that's what I did. The only thing I cared about at that time was but he would not find where my apartment was, or he would not threaten my friends or family and relationships. I went home that day with my study partner and boyfriend, and they were scared for me. 
Once I got home, I saw a little red package tied up with a little bow. And of course, this had to be from him. Classic maniac type move, sending packages. I opened the package, and inside were pictures of me and notes about how he was going to hurt people and how he loved my eyes and so many other things about what he was going to do to me, things that made me physically sick that I actually threw up. I stayed home and called my brother who was currently working as a police officer and he advised me to press charges. I did later that month and thankfully he was suspended. I got a restraining order against him and for a moment I finally had peace of mind. Let's start off with some background information. I'm a 19 year old male living in a semi-large city in Ontario. It was around 11 at night and I had just got done working out at the gym. I went to the grocery store to pick up some food for the next couple of days. Well, at the grocery store, I decided to get $120 cash back, money that I owed my mom. And unknown to me, as I left the store, money that I came so close to losing. Instead of going straight home, I decided to go for a little drive. I just got my car not long ago and the novelty of driving stick hadn't worn off yet. After about a half hour of driving around in the city, I decided it's time to head home. As I passed the gas station on the edge of town, but still close to my house, I decided now's a good time as any to pull in and fuel up. I pull in and I notice that I'm the only one at this gas station. I'm in a very industrial business part of town, the edge like I said, so there isn't much around. There's an empty lot without light beside the gas station and I noticed an SUV sitting there. I would say about 100 to 200 meters away but I don't think much of it. I get out and start pumping gas, and that's when I noticed a woman come around the corner and walk straight towards me. As soon as I noticed her, a shiver ran down my spine. I instinctively locked my car. She walked towards me quickly, staring at me pretty intensely the whole time. I got in a fight with my boyfriend and he left me here. Can you give me a ride to my mom's house? She said casually in her raspy smoker voice. Another chill ran down my spine as she repeated the question, almost word for word, in that same raspy voice. Um, I have to pump gas first, I said to her, keeping my eyes on her the whole time. She then walks around the passenger side door beside me and grabs onto the door handle. Can you unlock your car door? I'm cold and I've been here for a while. I have to pay for gas, I said, deciding to cut the gas pumping short. I walk inside and talk to the guy behind the counter. I told him that the girl outside was kind of suspicious and I didn't know her. He just kind of shrugged and I could tell he wasn't interested in getting involved, so I walked out. I figured she was probably high or something, but I would have to find a way to just get her to leave me alone. As I walk out, the SUV that I mentioned earlier started up. I watched the driver maneuver himself so he could just drive out the exit. He then stopped, engine still running. He was still about 100 meters away. Can you open the door now? I'm really cold. So many alarm bells were going off in my head already. First, she just looked sort of sketchy. She was dressed well enough, but her face was pretty rough. She was pretty much covered in makeup but it didn't hide a nasty looking sore on her lip. Her sunken eyes were dull and bloodshot and just dead looking. Second, she didn't seem like a damsel in distress. She didn't seem upset and she spoke without much emotion. No, that's not my problem. I need to go home, I said to her as firmly as I could. Come on, you're driving me home, right? I can't. I have to get home now. Reaching for my phone, I realize I left it in the car. I'm cold. I've been out here for hours. She shouts, pretty angrily for someone who's asking for a favor. Then I notice her glance at the SUV. I begin to speculate what's going on and raised my voice a bit. That's not my problem. I'm now standing at the driver's side door. 
I'm freezing. You said you would drive me home. That's not my problem. I started to raise my voice, and she started to raise hers. We weren't yelling, but it was getting heated. We went back and forth like that for a couple of minutes. My mind was racing. I thought about losing my car, about getting stabbed or shot, about getting robbed for the 120 I had in my wallet. Then I just lost it on her. Get the fuck back. You don't know who I am. Get the fuck back right now. I guess I was in fight mode at this point. I was pretty ready just to fucking clock this bitch if she tried anything. As awful as that may sound. I think I caught her off guard or something, because she stepped back right away. You better get out of here right now then, she said, walking backwards. I instantly felt my balls tingle sadly and climb back up inside me after she said that. I was now out of fight mode and into fucking flight mode. I watched her until she got a decent distance away, noticing she was walking sort of towards the SUV. I didn't watch for much longer. I hopped in my car and peeled the fuck out of there. I turned into a random subdivision, making sure I wasn't being followed. I called the cops and they said they would send a car, but there wasn't much they could do because there was no real crime committed. But I did the right thing, and she was most likely bait for some kind of robbery. I then drove home as fast as I could. Sorry if this was a bit wordy, I'm still obsessed with the details of what happened, and that's what's got me so disturbed. The emotionless way she spoke, the creepy way she looked, that SUV. I'm surprised I didn't just burst into fucking tears. I mean, I've been jumped before, but this just seems so crazy and predatory. The last thing she said to me absolutely haunts me. You better get out of here right now then. Laying it all out like that, so suddenly giving up the damsel in distress act, has to be the worst part of this, for me. I'm 22 now, but this happened when I was 16. At the time, I lived in Staten Island, New York. For a little background, I'm a female and at the time, I was 120 pounds soaking wet with a height of 5 foot 6. I thought I was invincible. I never imagined anything like this would ever happen to me. It was March 17th of 2013, around 10.30 p.m. And I was leaving my boyfriend's house. He walked me to the local bus stop as he always did. We joked and laughed while we waited for my bus to show up. Because it was kind of late, there weren't many cars on the street. I happened to notice a black SUV parked across the road. I didn't think much of it at the time. My bus eventually came and I said goodbye to my boyfriend and boarded it. I took a seat next to the bus driver. The rest of the bus was empty. The driver turned to me once we hit the first red light and he asked me, what are you doing out this late? It was random and a little creepy. I replied with, I was just with my boyfriend. We made small talk, and my initial apprehension was put at ease. The driver then told me that it wasn't exactly safe to be out and about at this hour, and that I should be more careful. I nodded, but as I said before, I was an arrogant 16 year old who thought she was invincible. As my stop approached, I looked at my phone and the time read 11.30 PM and my phone's battery was down to 5%. Great, I thought to myself. As I exited the bus and said my goodbyes to the driver, he told me to stay safe. I gave him another nod as the door folded back shut. For some reason, I just stood there and watched the bus make its way down the street until the taillights were well out of sight. As I stood there at the empty bus stop, a sensation of what I can only describe as impending doom came over me. The bus that dropped me off near my house was scheduled to arrive at 11.40, only 10 minutes, staring off into space, thinking about some things I had to do when I got home. A black SUV pulls up to the bus stop. The uneasy feeling I had earlier intensified, but I did my best to play it cool. The man rolls down the window and asks me, Hey, excuse me, do you know what time the bus is supposed to be here? He appeared to be a mix between Spanish and Asian, medium build. At this point, I did not make the connection that this may have been the same vehicle I just saw before I boarded the first bus. I figured that he was probably waiting for someone, so I replied, it shouldn't be long. 
He then asked me how long I'd been waiting. It was then I started to freak out. This guy was giving me the creeps, but I considered that I might be overreacting just a tad. Perhaps he was just trying to pass the time, but still, I kept my guard up. I answered that I hadn't been waiting long. He then proceeded to try and make more small talk. I was trying to be polite, but I also kept looking at my pitch black phone screen, trying to subtly hint to him that I wasn't interested in the conversation. It was dark out at this point. The only luminescence was coming from some distant streetlights. However, there were also two big trees outside the bus stop that were positioned in such a way that they blocked out most of the light. So, if this guy tried anything, the dark would have provided decent cover. I nervously clenched my phone, the uncomfortable feeling inside increasing with every passing second. He then told me that he was new to the area and didn't know his way around too well. He claimed that he was in the army and was stationed nearby. He then asked where the beach was. It's just down the street. I told him in a very matter of fact way, as if to convey, maybe you should go there so I don't have to look at you anymore. It was then that our eyes had met. I could see his face very clearly. His eyes were not like any normal human beings. It was as if they were looking right through me. Staring at me like a hungry fox who had just discovered a trapped, defenseless rabbit. Then, he asked me, Do you mind if you show me around? Come on, get in the car, show me around the area. I may have been a naive 16 year old, but I'm not an idiot. I knew if I got in that car, that would be the last time anyone heard from me. I was trying my best to show him that I wasn't afraid, so I politely declined while looking down the street for my boss. He then began to beg and plead. It was really kind of pathetic. I told him no once again. Then he said something that I'll never forget. Come on baby, it won't take long, I promise. My blood ran cold and my stomach felt like it was going to drop right out of my ass. I felt absolutely sick, like I was going to throw up. But I kept my cool and thankfully my bus was now in sight coming down the street and a feeling of relief washing over me. I told him no once again, thinking that was the end of it. He then told me he'd drive me home right afterwards. This guy would not give up. I had finally had enough. With all the strength and courage in me, I shouted, No! Leave me the hell alone, you fucking loser! As my bus pulled up, I heard him say something genuinely terrifying, and I quote, Fine bitch. I'll just follow you and see where you live. My heart started to race. My hands broke out in a cold sweat and my body began to tremble with fear. I quickly got on the bus and honestly, I don't know why I didn't tell the bus driver what was going on. I think I was just in a state of shock. I was hoping that Mr. Jailbait Hunter in the SUV didn't mean what he said and that he was just pissed off and trying to scare me. When I sat down, I looked out the window I saw headlights of the SUV tailing the bus. I thought I was going to have a mental breakdown. When the bus arrived at my stop, I ran like hell. I reached the front door to my house. It was usually unlocked, but tonight of all nights, it was locked from top to bottom. I frantically rang the doorbell while going through my bag to find my keys. Then I heard someone pull up out front. Without turning around, I knew who it was. Just like in the movies, I dropped the keys as I was trying to put them in the front door, but somehow, I finally managed to unlock the door. Before turning the handle, I heard a car door slam shut from behind me. I quickly ran inside and locked the door. In a panic, I explained to my mother and my older brother what had happened. My brother ran outside and looked up and down the street. I was shaking, absolutely consumed by terror. My emotions finally got the best of me, and I could no longer hold back my tears. We called the police, and they came and searched the area. They asked me if I had gotten a tag number, and unfortunately, I had to tell the officer that it was too dark to see. But I did notice a sticker of some sort of a bird on the backseat driver's side window. It didn't dawn on me until they left that this had been the same SUV that was across the street when I was with my boyfriend an hour prior. They told me they checked the army base nearby and around the area but no one had seen any vehicle matching the description I gave. 
All I could think about was what the bus driver had said to me and the irony of what took place that same night. Years went by and I didn't think much about this incident after that night. One day, I was scrolling through Facebook and see a picture that my friend had posted. It was a story of a man who had been following her home from work for the past three days. It was the same guy who I encountered five years prior. My heart felt like it was going to leap out of my throat. Looking at the post, I noticed that several other women had come forward, and they all shared similar experiences to mine. I ended up finding out that he almost kidnapped a 13-year-old girl. She allowed herself to be lured into his car, but once inside, she noticed a roll of duct tape, some rope, a pair of gloves, and a bottle of what turned out to be chloroform on the floorboard. She ended up jumping out of the window while they were stopped at a red light. I don't know all the details, but apparently, he got physical with another woman who was pregnant, trying to force her into his car. He got ballsy and started trying to abduct these women in broad daylight. The news found out that his name was Leo, and also discovered that he had a wife and two daughters, who were around three and five. They interviewed his neighbors. To my surprise, they defended him saying that all these women were lying. It's truly unbelievable just how stupid some people are. Five separate accounts from five different women who have no connection with each other have come forward and shared their experiences. Could you please dislodge your head from your ass and face up to the facts? Anyway, to this day, I have no idea what became of him, but the last thing I heard, he was still at large. I hope they caught him so no other young woman have to be subjected to this monster ever again. My name's Gerald and I'm 22. For the past year I've encountered a buttload of crazy people and have accumulated even more crazy stories. While most of them would make you laugh, the one I've chosen to share was terrifying while it was happening and still gives me shivers when I remember it. A little more than a year ago I applied for and got a job at my favorite convenience store across the street from my house. I would moved there my sophomore year in college and decided to stay after I left school. This little store has served as a savior to me. Living as young men often do, I had very little money, but I was always confident I could find something to fill my belly regardless of how much was in my pocket at the time. So, when the time came, I was no longer able to rely on my parents for money. The corner store was the first place I went for a job. I was in luck. Only the day before, one of the employees was fired for stealing from the register. I took his place, and I've been here ever since. Like any other corner store, we sell alcohol. Beer, wine, liquor, the whole boat. Naturally, this makes us a beacon for the local drunks. These folks have served as countless hours of entertainment. While most are harmless people, on one specific occasion, a horribly violent outburst occurred. It was a quiet Saturday night, about an hour before close. Most of the regulars had made their appearances a few more than once. The two involved in this incident had been in around 7 p.m. and had just returned. They were, or at least appeared to be a couple. I'd seen them around the neighborhood since I moved in. The owner of the store said they'd been customers since he bought the store, and that was 13 years ago. Although they were not very talkative when they came in, I never had any reason to believe either could be violent. However, that night something had changed. Upon arriving the second time, they went straight to the cooler containing the quart and 40 ounce sized beers. Nothing out of the ordinary, as I said, but tonight an argument between the two started soon after their arrival. Initially, I couldn't hear what it was about, but soon I could hear everything they said across the store. I minded my own business for a while, but once the female began screaming curse words at the man, I felt like I had to at least get them to take it outside. I wasn't sure what to say, but I began my walk to the opposite side of the small store. Before I was halfway there, the man started screaming back at the woman. I'm not sure exactly what she had said to him, but it had obviously infuriated him. Mere moments before, he had taken a quart bottle of bush or some other cheap beer from the cooler. All of a sudden, he began striking down at the woman's head with it sure if he thought it would break or if he intended on hurting her with the nearest thing, but strike after strike he continued. 
It was a horrifying thing to witness. I blame the entertainment industry for giving people the false impression of how easy it is to break a beer bottle over someone's head. I assure you, it's very hard. Following the fifth or sixth strike, the woman had dropped completely to the floor and stopped moving. The guy stood over her for a moment, but looked up when I assumed he heard me running towards him. The second he saw me, he ran out the side door and disappeared into the darkness. The sight of her laying there made me sick to my stomach. The blood dripping from her ears was almost as shocking as the ever-growing pool around her head. It seemed like a bad idea to touch her, so I made the decision to let the paramedics check her for a pulse. When they arrived, she was still alive, but they didn't have much hope for her survival. The cops certainly weren't in any hurry to get there, but when they did finally arrive, 45 minutes later, I filled them in on all I had seen. From the way they reacted, I got a strong feeling that they were very familiar with the two. While on shift, a few days later, my boss called with some news. The female was brain dead and her family had made the choice to let her pass. The cops had picked the guy up the following night. From the description my boss gave me, he didn't even seem to remember what had happened. The doctors that examined him said that it's likely he truly may not remember what he did because of the many years of alcohol abuse had possibly destroyed his brain. Sounds like he might not get the full punishment due to him under the law. I'm not really sure how I feel about that. Sometimes, it seems like people really do get away with murder. I serve as one of two managers for our local branch of a national convenience store chain. Starting as a wide-eyed 23-year-old girl, I worked my way up to night manager within five years. Not a groundbreaking achievement, I admit, but an achievement nonetheless. My job includes staying late after closing to count the night's drawers and drop the deposits for the day manager to put in the bank. I've never minded much having to do this job. The past five years working here has been on the night shift and nothing really scary has ever happened while I was on the clock. The only holdup in the history of this store occurred during the day. Therefore, I've never had any reason to fear working after dark. That was until just recently when I became the subject of someone's obsession. Talking about this in the first place is very embarrassing for me. I feel like when people hear about this, they think I am bragging about my looks, but I swear I'm not. I recognize that I'm an average looking woman, but that's as far as my vanity goes. I would have probably kept this incident to myself, but my therapist feels that sharing my experience will help other women as well as myself. So that's why we're here. Hopefully he's right and this horrible ordeal really can serve to help other women who have suffered from the same form of negative attention. Now that I put this off for so long, I guess it's time to tell you exactly what it is that happened. As I said, I work the night shifts six days a week. The number of weirdos I encounter is somewhat high. A fight once or twice a year, homeless drunks, the usual lot for a clerk in a convenience store in America. In spite of the craziness going on around me, day to day, I had managed to go unnoticed by any of those weirdos until around six months ago. About that time, this particular man began coming to the store. Initially, it was only once or twice a week, and when he did, nothing was said to me. However, as time passed, his visits became more and more frequent. This, in itself, isn't that odd. Anybody who's worked in a convenience store for a length of time can tell you regulars go with the territory. Some you will see every day at the same time, some more than once. So at the time, I had no need to be concerned. A month into this routine, I noticed that he would wait until I had no customers so I could ring him up. What made it so obvious was his concerted effort to start a discussion with me. How about that weather? You know, small talk like that. Although I found it funny then, I didn't realize I was encouraging him by engaging in these discussions with him. Soon the talks became more personal, less banal discussions. The first time I was asked if I had a boyfriend. I laughed it off, but the third and fourth were the first indication to me that I may have a problem on my hands. My suspicions were cemented the day he asked me out. Perhaps from instinct I said no, but I was careful to be kind in the way I said it. 
At that moment, he seemed to take it well. However, another clerk told me later that evening that he was actually very angry. I guess I never really learned to read a guy's body language. The next time he came in, he didn't talk to me and didn't return to normal until a few days later when he acted like nothing had ever happened. I had gotten the impression he had decided to let it go, but just one day later, he asked me to go out with him again. This time, he said he meant it just as friends. As before, I declined. He made no effort to hide his anger this time, and the expression on his face as he stood there really frightened me. The week following this second incident, I spent most of my time hiding out in the office doing paperwork. A male clerk he had befriended told me he had asked about me, but the clerk only told him I was out. I took advantage of this friendship to ask the clerk to talk to the man. I wanted him to ask the guy to not come into the store when I was working anymore. His most recent behavior had scared me. The discussion must have happened because I didn't see him for several days. Curious as to what was said, I asked the clerk what reaction the man had. He only answered by saying that the guy had severe anger problems and I should probably watch my back. I'm not sure if the clerk thought that would make me feel better, but obviously it made me far more scared. He stayed away from the store during my shifts and I didn't see him for a few weeks. One day during shift change, I was talking to the day manager and he mentioned a discussion that he had had with my stalker, as he called him. The manager had made the remark in passing that he didn't normally see him that time of the day. The guy told him he had stopped coming in on my shift because I thought it was too good for him. The manager said as he spoke, his eyes blazed with anger. I'd certainly dodged a bullet. At least that's what I thought then. In the coming weeks, I would catch glimpses of him walking through the parking lot. Sometimes he would stand at the edge of the lot just outside the glare of the lamp and watch me. The last time I caught him doing this, I called the cops. When they arrived, I explained the situation to them, but as you can imagine, they told me they couldn't do anything unless he blatantly threatened me. Of course, by the time they arrived, he was gone. I'm not sure if me calling the cops scared him or not, but I didn't see him for a while. Our last meeting was less than an hour after close, about a month ago. I had just finished the deposits and was preparing to leave the store. As I walked out of the office, heading to the door, I noticed the shadow of a man standing out of the glare of the lamp, just as my stalker had done. Terrified, I called the cops right away. There was no way I was going to leave the store alone at 12.50 a.m. with him standing outside. They showed up in less than five minutes, but naturally, he had already left. I got the usual speech, but they were at least kind enough to volunteer to come around for the next week or two at closing and hang around, until I could lock up and drive away. It wasn't until two weeks later that I heard the news. While I was engaging in work talk with the male clerk, he mentioned that my stalker had ended his own life the week before. I didn't believe him. So we went into the office and he brought the man's obituary up on the computer. Shocked would be an understatement. I knew I hadn't seen him, but I assumed the police presence at close had scared him off. It took me a few minutes to gather myself. I wasn't sure how to feel about this. While he had clearly become a danger to me, I couldn't help but feel bad for him. He obviously had a major anger issue, but I had no idea how bad his life had been outside the store. I've always thought it was important to try and be empathetic towards others. On the other hand, the relief I felt and still feel often overrides any feelings of sadness or guilt I may have. I can only hope that he has found as much peace in taking his life as I have. God, I know that sounds terrible, but honestly, can you blame me? Rest in peace, Robert. I do truly hope you have found the peace you so sorely needed. Recently a terrible event occurred at the gas station my family owns, and considering the fact the victim was somebody close to the family, I thought this would be the best way for him to be remembered. However, the only way my dad would allow me to share this story is on the condition I didn't use the people's real names. So, anybody interested in looking online for more information surrounding this crime will be disappointed because I'll have to change all the names. 
I guess I should start by giving you all some info on my family and our store. My dad bought it in 1996, a few years after his wife and he divorced. A few years later, he ran into our mom at the store. They had dated in high school and she had just moved back after her husband died. They dated for a couple of months and then decided to get married. By March of 2000, my mom was pregnant with my sister and then me about two years after. Most of our life has taken place in and around the store. My sister and I both learned to walk there and many, if not all, of our babysitters were women that worked there. My dad always said that the store itself was part of the family and that includes everybody who works there. If that's true, Steve should have been the godfather of the family. He'd already been working at the store 10 years before dad bought it and he was the one that taught him how the place ran best. They became fast friends, and since he had no living family, he spent every holiday with us. Heck, they even hunted together. That's the reason his death in a holdup hit us so hard. The day after it happened, a call from the cops came into the store asking for the surveillance footage of the robbery. It didn't seem right for Dad or Amy, my sister, to compile it, so I volunteered. I'll surely never volunteer for anything ever again. Going into this knowing what would happen made it harder, but I knew the others definitely couldn't handle it. I only knew the basics of the shooting, so as I watched the guy enter and approach the counter, a sick feeling rose in my gut. My instinct was to yell at the screen in a vain effort to warn Steve, but the stupidity of doing that stopped me. For the first minute, they stood and talked. I couldn't hear about what because the camera had no audio. I was caught off guard when he pulled out the gun. It was so fast. Even without the sound, Steve's fear was plain. He did his best to keep the robber calm, and he was until Steve handed him the money from the register. The robber had chosen the time right before closing to come in. Unfortunately for him, Steve had just dropped most of the cash in a few minutes before, and what he was handed was no more than a $20 bill, a five and five ones. He must have expected more. He began screaming and Steve tried to calm him down. He must have known somehow what was about to happen. His expression was of downright horror. Right before the shot came, he said something to the robber. At first I couldn't tell what it was, but after rewinding the video a few times, I could kind of read his lips say, oh God, please don't do it, you don't have to. Those were his last words. Five gunshots later, his life was over. The video ended with the shooter running out of the store. No one shows up on the screen again until about 1.17am when the officer stopped to see why the store was still open. He was the one who found Steve's body. When I was positive I had what they needed, I checked to make sure the clip had recorded to the thumb drive. Confident it had, I removed it and dropped it into a manila envelope and sealed it up. The teardrop hitting the envelope was the first hint to me that I'd been crying. I hadn't realized how important a part Steve played in my life. Just to make sure no one would bumble onto it, I locked the envelope in my desk drawer and called them to pick it up. I thought it may comfort you to know that the police know who the shooter is. It sounds like the guy couldn't stop complaining about how little he got and somebody snitched him out. They haven't arrested him yet, but... It's only a matter of time. I'm sure that will be enough to hang him, and that's exactly what I hope they do to him. I know his execution won't bring Steve back, but the thought of that SOB dying sure feels good. As a serial killer at Virginia State University. Growing up, my mother had made me watch murder shows with her, which eventually turned me into a paranoid 20-year-old who's afraid of her own shadow. My mother had heard of the killings and begged me to come home, but I couldn't just up and leave in the middle of the semester. i just have to stick it out and hope for the best. I wouldn't be worried if the killer had a pattern, but he didn't. He killed men and women. Nobody was safe. So far, eight students had been murdered, six males and two females. He branded them too, 
as if they were proud of what he did. He carved what number of victims there were on their foreheads. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Hey, my train of thought was interrupted by my roommate, Emma. Hey, I greeted. How's it out there? Pretty quiet. Besides the police cars patrolling, she replied, getting a yogurt out of our fridge and plopping down into the armchair. Looks like the hash-slinging slasher couldn't wait until midterms were over to begin his little killing spree. Tell me about it, I muttered, flipping through another page in my binder. I'm up to here in study notes. The entire coffee table was scattered with mathematical equations, scientific equations, and two English lit books that I had yet to read for next week. No one told you to take 18 units, Emma taunted, scooping a spoonful of yogurt into her mouth. Piss off, fam. Sorry, sorry. I'll tell you what. Let's go to the library. We still got a few hours to kill before curfew anyway. I got some studying to do too. I sighed. I'd been in our cramped dorm all day. Maybe a change of scenery would help me focus a bit more. Yeah, sure. Why not? I'll try anything at this point, I muttered, and I gathered my things. Emma was right. It was terrifyingly quiet outside. Everyone was too scared to come out of their rooms. Even though the murders usually took place in the early morning or late at night. Not Emma though. I guess Emma wasn't afraid of anything. Surprisingly, there were quite a bit of students in the library. Despite everything going on, midterms were still taking place. Which to me was a good thing. It kept us distracted from the ugliest outside. What type of rock is this? Emma asked, pointing to a sandy and crumbly rock in a geology textbook. Sentimentary, I mumbled then went back to solving equations. We studied in silence after that, Emma occasionally asking about another rock she couldn't identify. Having a change of scenery actually did help me concentrate better. All I had left to do was read the two English lit books. An hour later, Emma closed her geology book. I'm beat. Want me to wait for you? I waved my hand, not bothering to look up from my book. Nah, go ahead. I'll be there in half an hour. Okay, see you later she yawned, before gathering her things and leaving the library. The second book was much bigger, but I figured I could read at least a quarter of it before curfew and continue the rest over the weekend. It was a combination of Othello, Hamlet, Alexander Pope's essay criticism, and about three or four other stories. I'd finished Othello and gotten to Hamlet when my friend became vibrating. I blindly kept pressing the decline button repeatedly, it was probably Emma and her stupid geology rocks. I was making good time. After Hamlet, I was halfway through Pope when I looked at the library clock. 9.15pm. Oh crap, curfew was at 8.30. I'm dead, I whispered, and furiously gathered my things. I hadn't even noticed I was the last one here. I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. I ran out the door, dropping at least two of my pens on the process. It was eerily silent, even more silent than it was earlier. With a nervous sigh, I began fast walking back to my dorm, which was a 15 minute walk. However, with my huge bag and textbooks, it would probably take 25. I pulled out my phone and called Emma, who answered on the first ring. Where the hell are you? I've been calling you for over an hour. I know, I know, I'm sorry. I lost track of time. I'll be there soon, okay? I'm meeting you halfway. Emma, no, just stay there. Look, if I'm not home by 9.50, then come look for me or call the cops. It's too dangerous for you to leave. She huffed in irritation. Fine, 9.50, not a minute sooner. She hung up before I could reply, and I sighed tiredly, stuffing my phone into my pocket. Breaking curfew too? I jumped a million feet in the air my heart leaping out of my chest as I spun around and meet the green eyes of a man. He smiled and ran a hand through his hair. I saw you in the library. Figured you could use the guardian angel, he said. Uh, I'm okay. My dorm isn't far from here, I replied. I insist. A lady shouldn't be out by herself at these hours, especially not with a killer on the loose. I can manage. You can never be too safe. Name's Ethan, by the way, he said, walking alongside me, much to my dismay. Nice to meet you, I replied. Are you not going to give me your name? No. 
Ethan chuckled. All right, fair enough. What year are you in? Junior. Senior. Chemistry major. That's nice. He raised an eyebrow. You don't talk much, do you? Not to strangers in the middle of the night in particular? No, I said. Again, he chuckled. I can respect that. I promise you I'm not a killer. Just looking at. I know I was being kind of a jerk at this point, but something about this guy just seemed off. I couldn't pinpoint it, but my gut instinct told me this guy was bad news. It was still a ten or so minute walk to my dorm, so when he came across the North Dorms, I took this as my chance to book it. This is my stop, I said, stopping in front of the building. Uh, thanks. For the walk to my dorm, I mean. He smiled, white teeth shining against the darkness of the night. Don't mention it. Hey, listen. I know this is a bit straightforward, but could I get your number? My small smile faded. Um, I'm sorry, I just... I don't know you. I don't just give out my number like that. His boyish smile was replaced with a hardened expression. Really? I walk you back to your dorm and you can't even give me your number? I never asked you to. I don't owe you anything, Ethan. Gritting my teeth, I turned to walk off, when one of his arms suddenly wrapped around me in a bear hug and the other clamped over my mouth. You do owe me, he sneered. He began dragging me towards the woods, and I quickly planted my feet into my fighting stance. I stepped on his foot as hard as I could and slammed my head into his mouth. Once he released me, I spun around and elbowed him in the throat. I must have hit his Adam's apple pretty hard because he gurgled and fell to the ground. A man's groin and throat are always his weak spots. He tried to crawl away and I kicked him in the head. Well, that's nine in a row that the terrified, innocent little girl act works, I said, taking my knife out of my back pocket. I flipped Ethan over and pressed my foot into his throat, feeling the crack what was left of his Adam's apple. When a girl says no, Ethan, she means no, I sneered and stomped his throat. His blank green eyes stared up at the sky and I smirked. After carving the number nine into his forehead, I quickly ran to my dorm before Emma could throw a fit. After scolding me for breaking curfew, she went to her room and I went to mine. I wasn't supposed to have a number nine tonight, but Ethan just had to show up and not give me a break. If you're reading this far, Please don't think I'm some monster who targets random individuals because I'm not. I target those who do nothing but inflict pain. Partner abusers, women abusers, child abusers and so forth. I think I do a pretty good deed, don't you? As I was about to go to sleep, my phone rang, seeing my best friend's name on it. I quickly answered, hello? Hey, how are things over there? I sighed. I didn't have anything planned, but I got attacked and had to improvise. Aside from that, all is well. That was number nine. One more to go. I know you can do this. Think of the next person you're saving whenever you have to do it. Yeah, I know. I can always count on you, It. You have no idea how proud I am of you, Chloe. My name is Daniel Roberts. I'm a 20 year old man and I live in a small town in Arizona with my single mother. This story happened a year ago. I worked at a post office and it was lousy pay. But it was the only job I was able to get at the time. So one night, I was on my way home from work when I realized my gas was running low. So I drove to the nearest gas station and parked my car at the pump and as soon as I went inside the store to pay for my gas, this woman walked up to me. She looked very young, about 18 years old. By the way she dressed, I could tell she was a goth. Her face is covered in black makeup and had long curly hair. She had on a long gothic coat, skinny jeans, and long black boots. Anyway, she was very nice at first by asking me about myself, like, What's your name? Where are you from? Where do you work at? You know, normal questions. After I answered all her questions, I said, it was very nice to meet you. You have a good night. And I thought that was it. 
so I paid for my gas and walked outside towards my car. Then the woman began following me to my car, and I turned around and said, do you need anything? And she said no, and came to tell me that I had a nice car. And I said thanks. I tried to be calm, even though at this point, I am freaked out. She walked back inside the store, so I finished pumping my gas into my car and got inside. I was about to drive off, but then I felt a little hungry and decided to grab a snack. Since I thought I was going to be quick, I left my car running with the doors unlocked. I walked inside the store, and while I was looking for a snack, I noticed the woman walked out of the store and she was walking towards my car. And as soon as she saw me walk outside with her, she ran to my car and got into the front passenger seat of my car and locked the doors. I yelled at her to get the hell out of my car, but she didn't say anything and gave me an evil smile that creeped me out. Then she scooted over to the driver's seat and drove off. I immediately called 911 to report to them that my car was stolen. I told the police that my car has a GPS tracker and I can track down my car. So the police took me to where my car GPS was. We found my car. It was abandoned on the side of the road. It was vandalized and had writings on the seat saying, I will see you again and I will kill you. Still to this day, they never found her and I will always be traumatized for the rest of my life. This disturbing story happened during the year of 2019. However, if you would like to animate it, you shall. It took place in the time of quarantine, when almost everything was shut down. I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio, but moved to Virginia because the countryside is more peaceful and doesn't have as many thugs. I worked as a night auditor in a hotel. I won't say the name due to safety reasons. My shifts were usually from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. One night after my shift, I went outside while it was still slightly dark when a tall, stocky man started walking towards me, cradling something in a blanket. I had been trying to avoid as much human interaction as possible on account of the pandemic and I am a single mother to four very young boys my youngest being only six months old. I was already having a suspension of the man anyway because who would randomly be standing outside of a hotel with a baby at six o'clock in the morning? I tried to hurry to my car before he could get to me, but he said, excuse me ma'am, I need to go to your house to change my baby's diaper. He hasn't been changed since yesterday. Call me mean if you want to, but there was no way I was going to take him to my house. I had sympathy for the baby, but I had my own children's safety to worry about. I said, sir, I will unlock the hotel's public bathroom so you can use the diaper changing station in there. No, he yelled. I then started sprinting to my car. Of course, he chased me. I locked the doors as soon as I got in, but when I started driving, the man jumped out in front of me. He moved once he realized that either he was going to get out of my way or get run over. The next night when I clocked in, I noticed a letter in my cubby hole that read, You little bitch, you're lucky that we were outside a building full of people. Just remember that next time, your luck might not be as fortunate. Under my desk was a fake baby doll wrapped in some color blanket that the man was cradling the night before. The realization showered me in fear. I showed my boss and told him that I didn't want to work a night job anymore, thinking that the man might be stalking me during the nights. A few days later, I found out how wrong I was. I was at home enjoying a peaceful day with my children when I got a creepy letter with no return address that read, you think you got away? I followed you home from work. I know where you live. I know what you drive. I see you outside as you watch over your little blood bags while they're playing in the yard every evening. I know their names. I know what they look like. I know everywhere they go. Remember, 
I'm always watching. I kept receiving those sickening, disturbing letters for a long time. The police said that the man left no fingerprints on the letters, so there was nothing much they could do. I didn't let my children go outside much anymore. One morning, it was past midnight when I heard knocking on the door. I looked out the peephole to see the same man from the night at the hotel. I remained silent, thinking maybe he will think I'm not home until he said, I've been here a lot longer than you think. I know you're right there, and all four of your blood bags are in there somewhere. Just wait until I get in there and put my hands on them. I ran upstairs, gathered my children, and locked them in a room with me. I called the police, and that's when I heard glass shattering from downstairs. The man was in the house now. He searched downstairs for what seemed like 20 minutes, then came upstairs, kicking every door and shouting. The shouting grew louder. He was right outside the room we were in. The commotion startled my six-month-old, so he started whining and moaning. I brought him to my chest, trying to calm him. He was starting to quiet down until the man threw a heavy object at the door and shouted louder. My baby then threw his head back and let out a long and loud cry. The man started kicking the door until I finally heard the police sirens pulling in my driveway. The kicking stopped and I heard footsteps running down the stairway. The police caught him as soon as he tried to call out the back window. They told me that he had been wanted for assault, harassment, and child abduction. That happened two years ago and my oldest son, who is now eight years old, has not been the same since. He acts scared to go outside. My other three sons are now six, four, and two. However, they do not understand the situation like my oldest does, and I dread having to tell them, due to the trauma that it could bring them. I love to drive, like hours long drives to nowhere with no destination in mind, just me, my music, and the road ahead of me. Living in Nebraska, I'd often take back roads or lonely highways cutting through the countryside to small towns and eventually cities, and I'd usually take these drives at night since they were less traffic to worry about. I've done it since I've had my license four or five years ago, and I've never once had any sort of issue nor have I ever run into any trouble. That was until a few nights ago. For reference, I'm a relatively small 22-year-old female, and as I stated before, I often take these drives completely and utterly alone. They're a good way to clear my head when I'm stressed, upset, or overwhelmed, or for me to get a plan together to sort personal issues out. I've also done these long and lonely drives to get away from the toxicity of my household when I used to live with my parents as a means of coping with their alcoholism, though now that I've moved out and am in a much better place mentally, I don't really have the urge to get in my car and just drive anymore. However, on the night that this event took place, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed, stressed, and anxious with a ton of personal issues I'd rather not get into. I felt restless and irritable around my boyfriend, couldn't focus on anything else, and decided I could take a drive to clear my head. My boyfriend was understanding and told me to be careful and to not be gone for too terribly long since it was getting pretty late. I agreed, gave him a kiss goodbye, and left. I drove around our city for about 30 minutes, but I was still feeling on edge about everything transpiring in my personal life, so I decided to drive further north down those familiar, dark, winding one-lane highways. I kept the car at a steady 65 miles per hour taking the turns at a slower pace in case a deer jumped out around the bend and was just admiring the vast empty darkness of the snow-capped fields and barren trees. It was honestly a bit creepy being all alone with no cars in sight and seemingly the middle of nowhere. The few houses miles back from the road, lightless and the dead cornfields withered away and covered in snow. It was like something out of a horror movie and I half expected to see a ghost pop up in my rearview mirror see someone clamber out from the patches of trees dotting the horizon. The only light came from the headlights and 
Even then I still strained to see through the inky darkness of the night. By now it was just after eleven and I told myself that once I made the familiar roundabout that would either take you to a small town or back up towards the city, I would head back to the city and home. That roundabout was still maybe fifteen to twenty-five minutes away, but other than my imagination picturing the worst, I wasn't really all that concerned. I mean, I was by myself. I didn't have any other motorist to worry about, right? As I'm rounding around another bend, I notice a vehicle with its hazard lights maybe a quarter of a mile or something away from me. It was some sort of sedan, dark colored, and was angled to where only part of it was on the shoulder while the rest was jutted out into the road. Like they had pulled over in a hurry but didn't quite manage to do that. The driver's side door was flung wide open and as I slowed my vehicle down and angled it towards the opposite side of the road to pass, I could make out what looked like maybe blood on the open door. I didn't see anyone on the road or in the car and I was the only motorist in sight. Cell phone reception is spotty at best in this part of the country, but more often than not you couldn't get reception no matter how hard you prayed, which was definitely the case when I took a glance at my phone to see I hadn't had any service. So, a lone female on the road at night pulling up near a vacant vehicle that looks like someone had been attacked on the inside, with no cell service. No, I'm no dummy. I've watched countless episodes of Investigation Discovery and Criminal Minds, and read far too many true crime books to know that this had bad and danger written all over it. But there was still a small part of me that worried something terrible had happened to whoever was in that vehicle, and I thought I needed help. These roads don't get a lot of traffic late at night and temperatures were well below freezing. If someone were hurt or in trouble, there was no one and nothing else to help them but me. Still, I erred on the side of caution. I was still driving my car, though a bit more slowly, and as I approached the vehicle, I rolled down my window a bit, shut off the music, and called out. Hey, anyone there? Are you okay? I didn't hear a response. I worried they were passed out somewhere, but I wasn't about to get out and look for them. I told myself I'd call out one last time, and if I didn't hear anything I would leave, and the moment there was reception I'd call it in. And if I did hear someone, well, I had figured out my next course of action then. So again I shout out, hey, what happened, are you okay? There was silence for a beat, and then I heard rustling in the shadows of the trees followed by a gruff voice saying, Yeah. I was relieved at first, and was about to say something in response, or possibly even stop my car and get out, when I noticed three things nearly simultaneously. As I inched my way past the front of the sedan, I noticed that there was no damage to the hood anywhere else in the vehicle, which I found to be strange considering the blood on the inside of the door. In the rearview mirror, I caught a glance of someone coming out from behind the sedan, and they were making their way towards my car, fast. The person did not have any blood on them, or appeared injured in any way, wearing a mask. Not like a face mask from the pandemic, or a ski mask or anything normal, but one of those masks you could see in the Purge movies, and they were holding something in their hand. I don't know what it was. I couldn't get a look, but... From its length and shape, my guess was maybe a tire iron or a crowbar or something. I don't need to tell you that I slammed on the gas the moment I noticed those things and drove like a maniac out of there. My heart thundering in my chest and my entire body shaking. My window was still rolled down in my haste and the music was still shut off so I could very clearly hear someone, definitely a man, shouting at me, though I had no clue what they were saying. I just knew I had to get out of there immediately. I stole one last look in my rearview mirror as I drove away, mostly to see if they were getting in their sedan to follow Chase or if they had stopped. The man with the weapon was still standing in the middle of the road watching me, and right before I looked away from the mirror I saw a second man also wearing one of those creepy masks and no trace of blood on him. I probably broke every law for speeding that night, but I wanted to get as far away from those men as possible. As soon as I made it to the roundabout, I turned towards town, parked in the Walmart parking lot that thankfully still had cars from who I assumed were workers closing up shop, and proceeded to have a full-on meltdown. 
When I could pull myself together, I called one of my friends, T, who was a police officer, to tell him what happened and what I should do. He was concerned for me, and after asking if I was okay, where I was, did they follow me, etc., he told me since it was out of city limits, he couldn't do much on his end, but he could get in contact with the local police sheriff in that jurisdiction to take my statement and check it out. I agreed, thanked him, and while I waited for police to show up, I called my boyfriend. Through my hysterical sobs and panic, I managed to tell him what happened not even ten or so minutes ago. He was, as you can imagine, super freaked out for my safety and wanted me to either come home immediately or drive down himself to take me home. I told him the police were on their way to take my statement so I couldn't leave and that I was okay, but I stayed on the phone with him until I saw the familiar police cruisers pulling into the lot. I gave the police my statement and they assured me that they would go back to the spot I told them that the sedan had been to take a look and they would try to catch the guys who did it, though with no cameras and no description of the men I wasn't sure what they'd be able to do. I didn't even get the license plate number, though at the time of my panic, the thought never came to mind until the police were asking if I got it. All they had to go off of was a dark colored sedan and two guys with masks. After I gave my statement, I went home and stayed curled up close to my boyfriend the whole night, listening to every sound the house made in fear that it would be those guys arriving any minute to finish whatever it was they started. Since the incident, I haven't heard back from the police about whether or not they had any leads, and I'm not sure if they ever will. I'm just thankful I'm still here and that I didn't stop my car or get out. I'm not sure what would have become of me if I had. I still had so many questions that have no answers. What were they doing? Why? Was that blood on the inside of the car, or just a ruse to get more attention? If it was really blood they hurt someone else? What would have happened to me if I had stopped my car? Needless to say, I won't be going on any more late night drives to anywhere, and I hope I never cross paths with those freaks again. This is Blanche Monnier, born on the 1st of March, 1849, into a wealthy French merchant family from the city of Poitiers. Blanche was famed for her striking beauty and delicate manner. Naturally, this attracted a great number of potential suitors, some from prominent positions in high society. But Blanche didn't want to marry for money or prestige and she especially didn't want to spend the rest of her natural life with some beastly brute she barely knew. No, Blanche was in love. Around the age of 25, she had met a lawyer almost 10 years her senior. Despite his practice being a small and modest affair, Blanche was smitten with him. She didn't care if he didn't have the treasury or titles of some of her other potential husbands. She loved him for the nurturing, caring person he was. Yet, in 1874, upon finally expressing her desire to marry the man, Blanche discovered her mother's reaction not to be one of joy, but one of disdain and disgust. No daughter of mine is going to marry some penniless lawyer, Louise Monnier is thought to have said. You'll wed whomsoever your father and I choose. But Blanche was defiant. She told her mother that she was free to marry whoever she pleased. She wasn't an object to be traded to boost the Monnier's esteem, and if her mother insisted on behaving in such a ghastly manner, she'd have no choice but to elope with her law-practicing lover. That night, once all were asleep, Blanche packed a small traveling case with only a handful of her most precious possessions and attempted her escape. Yet when she reached the bottom of the staircase, she heard a shrill voice pierce the darkness behind her. Going somewhere? It was her mother. Louise had been watching and waiting to apprehend her daughter's attempt to fly the nest, and it turned out she had a rather draconian punishment in mind. What happened remained a closely guarded family secret for the next 27 years, 
and when the public came to learn of Blanche Monnier's fate, they were horrified by what they heard. To most who know her, Blanche was there one day and gone the next. The sprightly young woman seemed to have just dropped off the face of the earth. Blanche's uncle Marcel, when questioned as to what happened to Blanche, would give the same story as her mother. She ran away, said she was going to live with that lawyer of hers. We miss her terribly, and we wish she'd come home. But this lawyer insisted he had not seen his beloved Blanche since the day she'd requested to marry him, and placed the blame for her disappearance squarely at the feet of the Monnier family. Her disappearance caused such a concern that a representative of the Poitiers magistrate visited the home to verify Louise Monnier's story. There, they were shown how her armoire had been emptied of clothing, along with a note purported to be written by Blanche herself that referred to eloping with my beloved. This seemed to have satisfied the authorities, and the blame once again shifted to Blanche's paramour. And although he was never formally charged in connection with her disappearance, he insisted on his innocence until his sudden death in 1885. In the years that followed, Blanche was slowly forgotten about as the world moved on without her. Just another victim of class and circumstance in a culture that sees its daughters as little more than property. Then, on May 23rd of 1901, a high-ranking government official in Paris received a frighteningly intriguing letter from an anonymous author. The envelope that was simply marked with the French words, For Mr. Attorney General, the letter reads as follows. Dear Sir, It is with the great sorrow that I must inform you of an exceptionally serious occurrence. I speak of a spinster who is locked up in Madame Monnier's house in Poitiers half-starved and living in a putrid litter for the past 25 years, in a word, in her own filth. She is in dire need of assistance, as I fear her health to be in a grave condition. Please help her. Yours. It reads as if whoever had written the letter was just about to sign their name, then decided against it at the last moment. And maybe this is a sign that Madame Monnier's power and influence reach far beyond the regional government of Poitiers. Regardless of her high status, Madame Louise Monnier soon had her lavish home swarmed by French Jean de Marie policemen. She demanded to know why they were there, yet the commanding officer simply ignored her, instructing his men to thoroughly search the cellars and attic spaces of the large house. It was then that Madame Monnier realized why they were there, but there was no mad dash to escape, no attempt to hide her crimes. But then, the damage had been done. While searching the attic of the house, police found a small, locked door that they were unable to gain entry to. They demanded that Madame Monnier produce the key, but she told them that she'd misplaced it some time prior to their unexpected visit. This was of no import to the Jean de Marie, who promptly smashed the door off its hinges before squeezing their way into the tiny room of the other side. The sight that greeted them elicited terrified gasps and exclamations from the policemen. They were Jean de Marie, military policemen, trained to combat hordes of rioters on the streets of France. They were hard men, ready for anything, but nothing could have prepared them for what waited for them on the other side of that attic door. And this is what they saw. The woman they found had evidently been imprisoned in what can only be described as harrowing conditions. She was weak, on the verge of death weighing little more than 55 pounds by the time she was rescued. Confined to a small, filthy mattress, the woman was surrounded by pieces of rotten food, pails of urine and stale water, and piles of her own excrement. The carpet and sheets were positively alive with a nightmarish array of parasitic insects, fat from feeding off of the fragile form of the imprisoned woman. One officer described the stench inside the room as unbreathable, and the officers were forced to return with mass in order to continue their grim work. Yet the most shocking discovery of all came when the emaciated woman was asked her name. Officers were so shocked that they asked her to repeat it. My name, she said, struggling for breath, is Blanche Monnier. Blanche wasn't dead. Her mother hadn't had her killed as punishment for her escape attempt. Instead, she had been kept prisoner in a small windowless room, 
for almost 30 years. Blanche was rushed to the hospital following her discovery, and while it's certain that doctors managed to save her life, she was never quite the same. She continued to suffer from a number of mental health problems and struggled to adjust to her newfound freedom. Doctors diagnosed her with a variety of debilitating physical conditions, but it has to be mental scarring which Blanche suffered that proves to be the most debilitating. Psychiatrists declared that Blanche showed signs of anorexia nervosa, schizophrenia, exhibitionism, and coprophilia. Her anorexia is somewhat easily explained by the severe food restrictions placed on her while the devastating isolation she suffered can explain the schizophrenia. But somehow the exhibitionism hits harder than the former pair because it shows Blanche was so desocialized and damaged by her isolation that she'd forgotten why she had to wear clothes. Nudity wasn't taboo for her anymore, as if she'd somehow become feral as a result of her suffering. The exhibition of coprophilic symptoms are also enough to make even the toughest of us shudder, as the idea of a person driven so mad by hunger that they'd eat their own excrement is perhaps one of the most horrifying concepts imaginable. These severe mental health conditions led to Blanche being admitted to a psychiatric hospital in the central French city of Blois, where she'd eventually died alone and in obscurity in 1913, at the age of 64. Blanche's mother, on the other hand, managed to escape the swift and unforgiving justice she so richly deserved. Shortly after her arrest, she became terribly ill, and a French judge was forced to allow her to remain on house arrest instead of being interred at the city jail. Just 15 days later, after the news of her crimes had circulated among the Pontier peasantry, an angry mob began to gather outside of the Monnier home. It's then that Madame Monnier, upon learning of the vengeful mob, died suddenly as a result of some previously unknown illness. But between you and me, I think it's all too much of a coincidence that Madame Monnier just so happened to pass away in the face of imminent danger, and it's more likely that she took the coward's way out. It was more bad news in the case of her uncle, Marcel Monnier, who despite being initially convicted of kidnapping and false imprisonment, was later acquitted on appeal. Bizarrely, a judge suddenly found Marcel to be mentally incapacitated and that a duty to rescue was not a statute in the French penal code. Therefore, Marcel lacked sufficient grounds to be convicted and was set free. As horrifying though as Blanche's story was, it was almost lost to history for a time before 1930, when French author André Gide published a novel based on the incident. Interest in the case was reignited and the French people were once again horrified by the story of a mother who was soulless enough to inflict unimaginable cruelty upon her own flesh and blood. Louise Monnier had intended to lock her daughter away from the world until people forgot she even existed but history has a way of bringing to light what is done in the dark. So now all should know of Blanche Monnier, or as she is known by the French in the early 20th century, La Sequestrie de Pontier, the confined woman of Pontier. Take a look at this picture. What is it you see? Is it a doodle? Something someone scribbled absent-mindedly one day whilst talking on the phone? To the untrained eye, what's scribbled on this piece of paper might well appear to be gibberish, but to the improbable few of us that recognize old German cursive handwriting, they might well be able to make out the two words that constitute the entirety of that wall of text, Erzenschatzi and Kom. As it turns out, what you're looking at was intended to be a letter written by a woman named Emma Hawk, and addressed to her absent husband. Born in Ilvang in Germany in August of 1878, Emma was admitted to the psychiatric hospital at the University of Heidelberg after being diagnosed with dementia praecox at the age of just 30 years old. While a patient at the secure facility, Emma wrote a series of highly disturbing and upsetting letters to her husband, often consisting of just a few words repeated over and over again. In the letter you're looking at, she has written the words Herzenschotzikom, meaning 
Darling, please come. And then, com, 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 repeated over and over. It's thought that these phrases have been repeated almost a thousand times on the small piece of paper, and that Emma's husband was extremely upset upon reading the letter, as it was clear that her condition hadn't improved in the least bit since her admission. Emma died on April 1st of 1920, and the hospital staff decided to store her many letters in a rather special place indeed. You see, the University of Heidelberg, where Emma received her treatment, has an entire department dedicated to the artwork produced by its psychiatric patients, known as the Prinzhorn Collection. It's here that Emma's letters were filed away and forgotten about for 80 years, when the Prinzhorn Collection put on an outsider art exhibit in Manhattan, New York City. Once a source of horror and heartbreak for those that knew her, this new generation of artists were fascinated by such candid representations of mental illness. They became the subject of a number of documentary films and were even adapted into a theater play around 2019. Such creative types have managed to put all kinds of spin and interpretation onto Emma's letters, claiming the pieces say more about the person viewing them than they do about Emma herself. But anyone who knows the backstory of such a picture knows that all it speaks is the immense loneliness and suffering of a person who didn't understand what was wrong with her. A person whose sole wish was to be reunited with the man she loved. A man who barely even recognized her anymore, neither physically nor mentally. May she rest in peace. On December 10th of 1945, Homicide detectives burst into the home of Frances Brown, a murder victim who'd been gruesomely slain in her own Chicago apartment. She was discovered with a knife lodged in her neck and a bullet wound to the head, having been dead for a long time before she was found. Nothing seemed to have been taken from her apartment, but it was evident that Frances' killer had left something behind. A message scrawled on the wall of her apartment in her own lipstick, and this is what it said. For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. In the course of the investigation that followed, police found a bloody fingerprint smudge on the door jamb of the entrance door. They also interviewed a witness who claimed to have heard gunshots at around 4 o'clock in the morning, as well as talking to the building's night clerk, who said a large, nervous man of about 35 to 40 years old got off the elevator and left the building shortly after the shots were fired. This information led them to 17-year-old William Herons. On June 26, 1946, 17-year-old William Herons was arrested for attempted burglary. Although insistent of his innocence, Herons would make two full confessions to three separate murders, including that of Francis Brown. On September 4th, Herons admitted his guilt on burglary and murder charges, then tried to hang himself in a prison cell. This wildly contradicts Heron's original statements that he was only going to confess to the murders in order to save himself from the electric chair. Why take the years to save your skin, then try to take your own life immediately after pleading guilty? It's entirely possible that Heron's simply realized he couldn't do the time, and tried to escape an unjust punishment. It's more likely that the despair of knowing he was caught had set in, and with one of his victims being a six-year-old child, he knew his imprisonment would be rough, to say the least. In light of Heron's repeated claims of his innocence, no true motive has ever been established for the murders. But the photograph we're looking at may well provide a terrifying insight into Heron's mentality at the time of the killings. Maybe some people really are just consumed with the urge to kill, and maybe it's a craving as tangible as regular people's need for love, friendship, fulfillment, and satisfaction. Maybe for people like William Herrings, killing is the only way they can achieve any kind of emotional release. And what's particularly horrifying about his case is that it seems he was completely self-aware of his nightmarish predicament. He wanted to stop killing. He just couldn't control himself. I was almost 30 and female, and I have been told I look 16 to 18 depending on the outfit. 
I have an anxiety disorder and additionally I have issues picking up social cues so sometimes I misunderstand things or get paranoid about things that are really innocent so I've learned to question my thoughts. I've been working in the food service industry for a few years and in particular about two years at the Burger King this happened in. This incident happened about four years ago now. I had just started working some late night shifts and we hired a new manager, Paul. He was a foot or so taller than me, skinny, with dark eyes, and usually wore large glasses. He wasn't physically imposing, but still made me nervous because he was new, and male. There are reasons new males put me on edge, but that's for another day. After a few days, I noticed some strange things. Whenever I worked the counter, he would stand so close behind me that I could feel the cloth of his shirt brush my neck because he was looking over my shoulder. Again, I worked here before he did and had for a year or so. It bugged me. If I was stuck in the drive through area instead, he would stand in such a way that I was blocked in and couldn't get past him, and every time I bent over, if I looked up, I could tell that he was staring right at me. At first I figured I was just imagining it, that he wasn't purposely blocking me in. I had to be just paranoid again, I assumed. After a few more weeks of working there, he started buying pizza for the crew, or drinks, etc. for a nearby business, and he always was the one to go pick it up and bring it in. I wouldn't eat anything unless the rest of the crew did, and I never drank anything I didn't get for myself, nor did I leave anything in the back office just in case, because I just felt something was wrong. I kept telling myself it's overreacting, you're fine, but I couldn't shake the feeling. One night I was told I had to do a late night shift. Just me, Paul, and Jack, someone that has worked there for a long time, and I trust him implicitly. Before the others left, I asked Jack to please keep an eye on Paul because he scared me. That night, Paul asked me to clean the bathrooms, and I had no choice but to agree. To illustrate the layout to the bathrooms of the building, in order to get to the bathrooms from the main office, you go by the kitchen, around the corner, through a door, into an entryway. From there, you open the men's room door and... From there, there is a back wall stall with the door. That's the stall I was in. So I'm there in the main men's stall, and Jack is in the kitchen as far as I know, with Paul in the office. As my back is turned, I hear the propped open men's room door shut. I turn around, and blocking my exit to the men's stall is Paul. Immediately, I panic, because that means that's three closed doors between me and Jack. Paul holds up a pair of drive through headgear and makes a comment like, So I found these new ones in the office. Want to use them? I probably shouldn't give them to you, but I like you, so I figured why not. I decline, and honestly, I was shaking out of my shoes. Innocent as the dialogue was, he was looking me up and down the whole time, and it just felt creepy. He stood there about a foot away and just stared at me, not saying anything. And after a minute or so, Jack came in and said that there was a phone call and Paul had to come get it. Naturally, I booked it out of the bathroom and stuck myself to Jack, explaining that I was really scared and felt uncomfortable with the way Paul looked at me and the odd way he was behaving. Well, to me it was odd anyway, but again, I felt like I was probably being paranoid. He told me he wouldn't let me out of his sight the rest of the night and that he was sorry that he had been distracted. He didn't like Paul either and he kept good on his word. A few hours later, Paul says he's grabbing pizza and some soda from the place I mentioned earlier. When he came back, he called me to the back office and offered me a glass of soda, pre-poured. I said, no thanks, I'm fine. Thinking to myself to the time that I'm being overly stupidly paranoid, but then again, why did he always bring soda? We had over a hundred kinds on the premises. He asked me another two to three times if I was sure, and I again declined, Jack right beside me. Then Paul asked me if I had a boyfriend. I did, but I lied and said fiancé because I figured it maybe dissuaded any potential flirting. He says, Fiancé? Aren't you a little young for that? I don't know why, but I told him my age. He just kind of sat there and looked me up and down really slow. Oh. I thought you were 16 or 17. From there, he left me pretty much alone. Believe it or not, three days later he was arrested because the place he worked for before, 
he had inappropriately touched an underage female co-worker, threatened them, and told them he was a cop and so on and would arrest them if they told. Eventually he was transferred from there to where I work and we were never told anything till his arrest. He comes by twice since then, even though he's not allowed on the property because we have minors on sight. I'm still freaked out, especially because the last time he came around he came through the drive through where I was standing. So to Paul, I hope I never see you again and you get exactly what you deserve. For a little backstory, the legal drinking age in my country is 18, so if you want alcohol and didn't have a fake ID or a parent to get it for you, then you had to wait outside of the off license, which is like a liquor store for the Americans, until someone came by who agreed to go in and purchase the alcohol for you. So we waited around, found someone who was willing to go in and buy our alcohol for us, and got him to purchase a few bottles of vodka for me and a few friends, two of which I was with. Now, as it was around 6 p.m., we decided it was too much of a risk to decant our vodka into a less suspicious-looking bottle in the middle of the street, as it was very busy, so we did what we would usually do in the situation and found a nearby food place to quickly run in and use the bathroom to decant our alcohol so we could be on our merry way. This time, we chose to do this in a nearby McDonald's. We'd done it in before, so we knew it was a safe bet. So we go into the McDonald's and head straight for the bathroom, as we'd done a million times before. As we get into the bathroom, me and my other two friends, we'll call them Harriet and Kara, all occupy one cubicle to get the job done and get out and back to our drinking ASAP. And as I previously mentioned, we'd done this lots of times before and usually opted to come into this McDonald's as it was usually busy, which meant no one paid attention to three teenagers running straight to the toilet without purchasing anything. So anyway, we're all in there doing our thing when I could suddenly hear a lot of shifting and moving above us. I figured it was possibly the air conditioning and opted not to tell my friends as I thought it would freak them out. We get the job done and as we're about to leave the cubicle, we hear a giggle and a, where he girls off to? I looked up and see the forehead and eyes of a male who looked to be about 30, just staring out from underneath a tile in the ceiling that he'd slightly lifted. We're all in shock, just staring at this guy who proceeded to giggle down at us and ask our names, where we were going to, and if he could come. We're all in shock because, let's be honest, who really expects there to be some random guy in the ceiling of a McDonald's? Being a teenager who thought I was untouchable, I proceeded to tell the guy that he was a perv and to F right off. The guy seemed to enjoy this and giggled a little more, still shifting around in the ceiling, never taking his eyes off of us. Now I should probably mention that along with pouring our drinks into other bottles, we pre-rolled a few joints so we were scared to alert anyone at this point as we were young and terrified of our parents finding out. The guy still staring at us proceeds to ask questions like, what age are you guys? Where do you live? Can I have some of your drink and smoke of your weed? still all the while twitching and fidgeting overhead. He then started to lift the tile, and as we were all stuck in a cubicle with this guy above us, we knew the only way for him to get down was to come down directly on top of us. So we got out of there at that point pretty quickly. We went outside and discussed what we were going to do, and I decided to go back in and alert someone, as it's a very busy McDonald's, and I knew that there would be women and children in and out of the toilets until closing time, I didn't want to risk that creep staying up there just to spy on them, especially since I knew he was there and had witnessed his behavior firsthand. So I go in, tell a member of staff that I'd been in the toilet for a long while talking on a phone call. Terrible lie, but my 15 to 16 year old brain was too scared to tell the truth in case they alerted the police. And that's when the guy had appeared and, to my shock, they were completely unsurprised. They were just angry more than anything. I've seen a few male members of staff enter the toilet and I figured they could handle it from there so I went on my way. We still went into that McDonald's but never had any encounters with that bathroom fairy. We're not even sure if the guy got caught as we didn't hear anything about it afterwards.
So a few days after my 19th birthday, a few of my buddies and I are rolling around town in one of our cars, passing bottles and generally getting up to no good. We find a spot to park up, have a few smokes and blast some music, hanging out and just messing around until long after the sunset. Eventually, once we get hungry enough, we decided to drive over to Burger King to get a bite to eat. Now, I'm pretty lit by that point, and I've been lying if I said I wasn't generally being a complete jerk here, but here goes. So the Burger King drive through is closed for some reason, so we park the car up, get out, and head into the restaurant. And at the head of this huge line was this giant ham beast who was in the middle of waving her arm flab around, making some animated complaint about her order. My drunk buddies and I proceeded to watch this ham beast making an absolute idiot out of herself for like 10 minutes straight, holding up the entire line until eventually she steps to the side to wait for her corrected order or whatever. Either way, the line starts to move again. Everyone is super livid at this hog lady for holding up the line and I could tell the workers behind the counter were less than pleased with her too. So by the time I get to the front to give my order, I'm feeling all cocky and righteous and for some reason I had it in my head that if I made the workers laugh by roasting the hog lady, I'd get like a free meal out of it or something. So I say something to the effect of, may I apologize on behalf of humanity for the irate snuffling of my heavy friend here. No one laughs. They all just look pretty shocked, looking back and forth between the ham beast and myself, waiting for the aftermath. She turns red in the face and I expect her to explode on me. I'm ready for the black eye or whatever. It was worth it, just to hear my buddies cracking up behind me. But she didn't flip her lid. She didn't say a word. She just sort of stood there steaming mad until the guy behind the counter appeared with her amended food order. Then she just sits down and starts eating her food. We get our food and sit down on the opposite side of the restaurant, and all the while my buddies are like, Come on, man, you burned her. Jeez, dude. But I'm looking over at her, because the ham beast is on her phone, just talking all quiet, but every so often she shoots us, a little bit of a look with this big smug grin on her fat face. I don't know what I was expecting to happen, but why I thought I'd get away with it, I have no idea. Because the moment we walked out of that restaurant, we just hear from behind us, There he is. That one, right there. I look around, and she's pointing at me, the same smug grin on her face. Then when I turn back, there's a gun in my face. I honestly can't remember what the dude was screaming at me, only that he was, but I know it was her husband. It's weird the little details you notice when something like that happens to you. I distinctly remember seeing the dude's wedding ring on a finger that was wrapped around the handle of the pistol. I'm not a gun guy, but that thing was an incredibly big pistol, like huge and all I did was sort of zone out and look down the barrel for a few moments with this guy's screams ringing in my ears. It was only when he pushed it to my forehead that reality came back to me and hit me like a ton of bricks. I just remember shaking so hard that when the guy told me to get down on my knees, I could barely react. He screamed at me to get on my knees because I didn't deserve to die on my feet, and that line stuck with me even to this day. I've never been so scared in my entire life. If you notice, I haven't given my name or where this happened or when it happened. This is to give me enough anonymity to admit that just after I fell to my knees, and I mean fell to my knees, I just straight urinated my pants. Which I didn't even know was really a thing. I mean obviously I've heard about people being so scared they wet themselves, but I didn't think it could actually happen to people. But I suppose since I was full of booze and that large coke, there was plenty in my bladder to void. And void my bladder I did. Somehow, I had found a way to make a terrible situation even worse. Not only did I think I was about to die in a parking lot, while a whole restaurant full of strangers looked on in horror, I was about to die soaked in my own urine, cowering and shaking, on my knees outside of a freaking Burger King. 
He starts shouting other stuff at this point too, but I can't quite remember that either. I was just waiting for the moment my light switched off, a feeling like I'd fallen asleep real fast that I'd never, ever wake up from. I remember trying to shout something myself, something about how, will someone please call the cops, or whatever, but fear is a powerful thing. I couldn't speak. I mean, it was like a nightmare come to life. One of those where you try to scream for help, but your voice just sort of dries up in your throat. The next thing I remember are my ears pricking up to the word cops being spoken by some bystander just out of my view. Then I hear the distinct voice of the ham beast repeating the word, only this time, it's not me that sounds scared, it's her. I feel the tip of the pistol leave my head, and by the time I summon the courage to look around again, I see the pair of them, ham beast and gun guy, screeching out of the parking lot in some battered old sedan, followed swiftly by the blaring sirens in the distance. It was only when I was giving my statement to the cops that I noticed my buddies were gone, and not only were they completely out of sight, so was the car. So I had to be driven home to my parents' house in a freaking cop car, which clued them into the fact that I had been drinking, which to them was far more worthy of their attention to the fact I'd almost just been shot in a Burger King parking lot. They tried to ground me for like a month, but they didn't need to enforce it. I was too shaken up to leave the house for the first week entirely. Just be careful who you're talking to or trying to be funny. You never know who's psycho enough to put a gun to your head. As we slowly enter the fall season, I'd like to share a story with you that happened to me a few years ago. I have mentioned this story to some of my close personal friends and family, many of which don't believe me, and that's fine. They probably think I'm just joking around or trying to scare them, but I know I experienced something that night and I wish I had a better explanation for it. At the time these events took place, I lived on a quiet street a little outside the city, but not quite into the suburbs. My street had a big rundown house at the very end of the block that was across from an unused parking lot in an out-of-business bar. The person who inhabited the house before it became dilapidated was Mrs. Morgan. Mrs. Morgan was an old curmudgeon in every sense of the word. Every time my friends and I would walk by the house, she would yell at us and make some insanely random comment like we were trampling her garden or using her garbage to play hide and seek or some other incoherent nonsense that wasn't true. Even though my friends and I did get into some adolescence trouble around the neighborhood, we never did anything to Mrs. Morgan. Our parents always told us that we should try and be nice. I mean, she was a widow and had no children, so it must have been a pretty lonely life. Rewind about three years ago and Mrs. Morgan unfortunately passes away, and the house becomes abandoned and, I believe, eventually condemned. At least there were signs on the boarded up windows and doors, but I never got close enough to read what they said. Needless to say, it became an eyesore for the community in what was a pretty quiet and uneventful street. My girlfriend at the time only lived a couple of blocks and I would usually walk to and from her house when we hung out. It was literally a four minute walk top, so it was no big deal. I would pass Mrs. Morgan's abandoned house and the empty parking lot with the out of business bar every time I walked to and from her house. Now fast forward to a few years ago, the last time I ever made that walk. It was about 3 a.m. on Halloween night, I guess technically November 1st, and I was walking home from my girlfriend's house. I was supposed to be home way earlier in the night, but we both fell asleep watching scary movies and pigging out on the extra candy her parents didn't hand out. As I made it to my street and started my walk past Mrs. Morgan's house, I heard a noise. I stopped for a minute to make sure it wasn't a skunk because for some odd reason that's the first thing that popped in my mind when I heard the noise. I slowed down a little bit and looked at the house as I proceeded cautiously. That's when I noticed the front door that was usually boarded up and had a sign posted on it was now open. I tried to rationalize why the door was now open, saying to myself it was probably the wind, but then again, it was a beautiful calm night. I then paused in front of the house and looked directly at the front door, and that's when I saw her, Mrs. Morgan, right there, staring back at me. I knew for sure it was her. 
But how? She had passed away and the house was clearly unlivable for anyone else. At this point, I was so scared that I just shouted something out. I don't even remember if it was words or just noises. The figure stepped onto the front porch and continued to stare at me. I broke my stare and just started running back to my house, turning back every now and then to see if she was still staring at me or perhaps following me. I made it back to my house probably 30 seconds later and opened the side door and went down to my room. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. I'm not sure if I was overtired or just had scary things in my subconscious with it being Halloween and watching movies all night, but I know I saw Mrs. Morgan standing there only a couple of feet away from me. Whether it was a true paranormal encounter, or something that my mind made me think I saw, I will never know for sure. But hey, they always say that the veil between the living and the dead is at its thinnest on Halloween, and now... I actually believe it. Let me start this story by saying I have only shared this story with a few people up to this point. I trusted a few close friends who I thought would believe me, but that's about it. I can remember the events of this specific night vividly. My parents own a camp on a local lake about 25 minutes from my hometown. It's pretty awesome to go there bring friends and basically do what we want. My friends and I would usually throw smaller parties out there all summer long. There was always activity on the lake, but nothing that really ever raised any alarms. We kind of just chalked it up to either boats, wind, or animals if we thought we saw something in the lake after it got dark. One Halloween night, I decided it would be a good idea to skip the Halloween party that was taking place in town and bring my boyfriend back to the camp house for the night so we could be alone. My parents thought I would be at said Halloween party and would be spending the night at a friend's house. We arrived at the camp pretty late around 9 or 10 p.m. One thing I remember about the camp is how dark it was, void of any street lights and usually only illuminated by the stars in the sky. My boyfriend and I stayed up for a couple of hours talking, eating, and I think we played a board game or something like that. I would guess we fell asleep at some point after midnight. After about an hour or so of sleeping, I woke up suddenly to what seemed to be a loud blast, like a gunshot, but distorted somehow. I just remember it being so loud that I couldn't even remember where I was when I woke up. I looked over the couch, and my boyfriend was somehow still asleep. I got up and looked out the back door window, which had a view of the lake. I saw something that looked like a light, or a ball of light over the lake. I stared at the floating light in confusion trying to figure out what it was. Was it a flashlight or something glowing from under the water? Without really thinking, I slipped on my flip-flops and I went outside and approached the shore, still staring at the light, squinting my eyes trying to make out what it was. It was an orange-colored light, maybe 75 feet out into the lake and what seemed to be floating a couple of feet off the top of the water. After about two minutes of continued staring and squinting, the orange color changed to a bright purple, and several white specks of light came out of the purple glow and hovered all around the glowing orb. As I started to freak out as to what this could be, I was forced to my knees by the loud blasting noise I heard earlier. I started to plug my ears, collect myself, and turn back to the house to grab my boyfriend. I saw a huge flash and the next thing I remember was waking up in an Adirondack chair on my neighbor's yard the next morning. My flip-flops that I wore outside to get a closer look at the lake were gone. I had no idea how to explain the events of the night and, long story short, I went to the doctor and after seeing neurological specialists, they don't show any sign that I could have had an episode. I've been told that it was most likely a vivid nightmare and that I was sleepwalking and that's how I ended up on my neighbor's porch. Also, that would explain why my boyfriend never woke up. However, I believe this night I saw something otherworldly. I don't believe in the paranormal and until this point, I didn't believe in the extraterrestrial. But this didn't feel like a nightmare. It felt real. I can still see the images and hear the noises from that night. I know many of you may not believe my story and that's fine but I feel like I wanted to share the experience I had that night. I'm no longer with that boyfriend and 
even though he was concerned for my well-being, especially immediately after the events, I don't think he really believed my story either. Needless to say, I spend less time at the camp and am reminded of this night every year around this time when Halloween decorations start popping up in the stores. The events of this story took place when I was 18 and in my senior year of high school. I'm 27 now and still have horrible flashbacks from that Halloween night. My friends and I liked to party in high school, and Halloween was obviously one of the best nights to go out and party. We got to dress up in sexy outfits and have an excuse to act a little crazy. My friends usually drew all the attention from the guys we went to school with. I was still friends with all the boys, but none of them really ever showed any interest outside of friendship. Anyway, on this particular Halloween, we had a party at my friend Steve's house. Like a lot of high school parties, no one knew how to handle their alcohol. At about 11, the cops had already been called for a noise complaint. The party scattered and everyone ran as to not get detained or get their information taken by police. My friend Amy, who was getting into a car with her boyfriend, told me to jump into the car with her friend Dave, and he would take us to another party, which I begrudgingly decided to do. The car ride was weird. Just him and I, who didn't know each other and didn't really have much to say. Awkward. The car smelled like Slim Jims and body odor and looked rather messy. Dave had a mask, which was on his lap while he was driving. He had a hooded sweatshirt, blue jeans, and brown work boots on to complete the costume. He also had a scraggly beard and greasy hair. I tried asking questions to make the drive less awkward, but he didn't really answer them and didn't seem interested in holding a conversation. Finally, I asked what school he went to and he responded, dropped out of college a year ago. So I asked, well, how old are you? He responded in a shaky, almost nervous voice, I'm 25. This freaked me out a little bit because he was older than me and he just dropped out of college at the age of 25. Also, he was 25 and was just leaving a high school party. Trying not to let him in on the fact that I was kind of nervous, I asked, so how do you know Amy? And he responded in his shaky and unflattering voice, he said, who, who, Who's Amy? I sunk into my seat, pinching my sides, not knowing what to do. She's the bond who told me to get in the car with you. He responded with a very stoic, Oh, her? Yeah. She told me you were single. I didn't respond. I honestly didn't know what to say. Did this guy really not know Amy? Or was he just tipsy and confused? I texted Amy as we were driving to tell her how angry I was, but she didn't answer. About 10 or 15 minutes in the car, which seemed like forever, we arrived at a house. It didn't seem to be a very nice part of town, or at least an area I was accustomed to going to parties. I looked for Amy's car, or any car I recognized, but it was just too dark to point anything out. We approached a red door with chipped paint lit up only by a dull front light. Dave didn't even knock and just walked into the house, so I followed him, hoping to see a familiar face. The house was cold and smelled awful. We walked into the front room, which I assumed would be the living room. It was dirty and had an olive green shag carpet with an old brown couch. The walls were white with chipped paint and stains everywhere. Piles of pizza boxes and beer cans lined the floors. The room was only lit by one lamp that was on the floor and it gave off a very low light. On the brown couch there was a man and woman sitting very close together but not really moving. They looked to be passed out or maybe just drunk. We walked into the kitchen which was just more of the same. Trash and that horrid smell of garbage. In the kitchen there was a man probably in his twenties who looked like he may have been using. He gave Dave a high five and introduced himself to me as Skip. He looked at Dave and back at me and smiled. His yellow teeth and bug eyes made my skin crawl. The other man in the kitchen was an older gentleman, maybe in his 40s or 50s, I couldn't tell. He said nothing and just looked at me. I felt sick to my stomach and the only reason why I didn't run out of this place was because I had no clue where I was and had no clue if these people were capable of anything dangerous. 
Again, I texted Amy with no answer, deciding to not call as my phone only had 5% battery. Dave escorted me into the back room, which was kind of like a screened-in porch. I felt a brief moment of relief seeing about six or seven people out there. There were only two girls out of the bunch, and they were half naked and looked like they weighed a maximum of 90 pounds. I could feel everybody staring at me, but at least there was a group of people and I wasn't secluded or alone with this Dave. I know it sounds crazy, but I felt almost safe being around this larger crowd, but this temporary relief faded very quickly when the two girls left with all the guys who had been on the porch. They re-entered the house and disappeared out of sight. As I sat in this screened-in room trying to think of my options, Dave finally spoke up and said, I think you're really cute. I said thanks and kind of shrugged it off. He got up and started to rub my back and began breathing very heavily. After about five minutes of the most unpleasant back rub I had ever had, he stepped in front of me and asked if I wanted to go somewhere more private. I said to him in a terrified, cracking voice, I I'm sorry, but I'm not that kind of girl. I could see the displeasure and anger in his face, and I could feel the tears coming. Then nothing short of a miracle happened. One of the girls who went inside just a minute before began to scream erratically, swearing and yelling at everyone in the room. Dave ran upstairs, leaving me downstairs in the back room alone and without even thinking twice, I got up and climbed out the window and ran. I didn't care that I didn't know where I was. I wasn't going to stop until I was to a gas station or a 7-Eleven or something. I was running down the street, staying close to the sidewalk, trying not to bring any attention to myself. After what seemed like a few minutes, I luckily approached a 24-hour Walmart. I walked in and had the night manager call my parents as my cell phone was now dead. It was about 30 minutes from my house and my parents were on their way. Just as I thought I could relax and try to put these horrifying events behind me, Dave and his friends walked into the Walmart. They didn't see me, but I couldn't believe that they were in the same store. They were looking around like they were looking for something or someone. Was it me or was I being paranoid? The next day, Amy called me and apologized all day, crying and asking what she could do to make it up to me. I got some solace that she confirmed the person I got into the car with was actually Dave and not some random guy, but was still left traumatized thinking about what could have happened. It's been years since that night, and I know it could have been a lot worse, and I'm lucky that I was able to leave with no physical harm, but still wouldn't wish the experience I had that night on my worst enemy. I haven't seen Dave, Skip, or any of the people I saw that night, and hope I never do again. Back when I was a student, I used to work as a bartender in a nightclub here in Liverpool. Most places kicked out at about 2am, but we stayed until about 6am and just mopped up all the business that came spilling out of the other trendier places. This meant that we got some absolute messes propping up our bar on a nightly basis, and you could roughly divide the idiots that patronized us into four categories. 1. Happy drunks, occasionally annoying but generally favorable. 2. Sad drunks, frequently annoying, tend not to tip. Three, sleepy drunks, usually have to rouse these buggers out from the warmer, comfier corners of the end of the night. And last but not least, the rare and mystical blackout drunks. Totally unpredictable, avoided all costs, removed from premises as soon as possible. When I say blackout drunk, I don't necessarily mean people who just got too drunk to stand up and end up passing out. No. Blacking out when drinking is an actual medical thing. Don't quote me on the ins and outs, but from what I understand, some people have a very particular reaction to alcohol. Not all the time, just some of the time, and it causes a complete mental break. People can do outrageous things and have no memory of it whatsoever. They have zero inhibitions, zero social cues. The car is driving, there's just no one at the wheel. Now you see how dangerous that can be and why I added the whole remove from premises type thing. So the stage is set for my scariest post-work encounter ever. It's been a quiet night. People are coming and going in dribs and drabs and we get this one guy who comes in dressed in what looked like work gear. 
He seems a bit worse for the wear, but more like he just had a rough day, so my colleague gives him the benefit of the doubt and gives him one last pint of lager for the road. Maybe an hour after, he's staring into space with this glassy, watery look in his eyes. Classic blackout case, not falling down drunk, still semi-lucid, but there's just no one behind the eyes. We're close to closing anyway, so I prompt the door staff to come over and ask him to leave. He seems a bit confused at first, but soon complies and he's out the door. No drama. We close, do a really quick clean down, and we're all out the doors about 45 minutes later. I usually walk all the way home since it's only a fairly short distance, and the area tends to be completely deserted at the time of morning. Only on this occasion, our blackout drunk friend is sitting on a wall on the opposite side of the street, just staring into space like they always end up doing. But as I'm looking at him with a bit of concern, wondering how he's going to get himself home, he looks up at, notices me, and then immediately starts crossing the road towards me. He doesn't engage though, he just stays behind me on the pavement, following at a steady pace. I'm getting increasingly frightened and I'm trying to keep my cool, but I can actually hear his footsteps getting louder and louder on the pavement behind me. So I pull out my phone and fake a call with my boyfriend, I was single at the time, saying I was about to catch the bus home. But uh, what's that? You want to come and give me a lift? You'll be here any second because you're already in the area? Okay, thanks babe, you're the best. Then, heart pounding. I walk about 50 meters to the nearest bus stop and plonk my butt down on the bench. Blackout guy hangs around for a bit, not looking like he's doing anything in particular, but I know what he's hanging around for, and it's scaring the bejeebies out of me. But thankfully, with a bluff of my boyfriend coming to pick me up having apparently worked, he starts shuffling off along the road and eventually out of sight. Only trouble was, he walked the same way I needed to get home, but... It was no massive issue, I could just hop the first bus, it was due in like 15 minutes, and take the L for the bus fare, but I'd definitely get home safe and sound. Bus comes, I get on, take a seat, happy days. Next bus stop comes along, the bus stops, only one passenger shuffles onto the bus and drops a handful of change into the little coin tray. I look up, guess who it is? It's Blackout Guy who without looking at me walks past and takes a seat just behind me. I'm just absolutely bricking it by this point and I've completely run out of ideas. I know the guy's going to get off at the same stop as me, follow me home, and then what? I lived alone at the time, I'd have been buggered. Out of pure nervousness I remember checking my time, that's when I got the idea that saved me. Right by my flat, immediately as you get off the bus there's a Tesco Metro and since it was just past 7am, it would have just opened. That Tesco would have been rocking a security guard and possibly an office I could ask him to hide me in. It wasn't the best idea, but it was definitely worth a shot, and it turned out it was the best idea I could possibly have had. Like clockwork, the guy got off the bus with me and followed me to the Tesco. I was a bit shaky when I approached the security guy, but as soon as I explained what the deal was, he ushered me off into a security office where they normally detain shoplifters and all that. Police were called, and the blackout guy actually hanged around the Tesco, waiting for me to reappear, so he was an easy caller. I'm not sure if they charged him with anything, or just gave him a bed for the night. I don't care though, to be honest. He was out of my hair, I was safe, and that's all I was arsed about. I don't know if he saw through my fake phone call or something, but him working out that I was on that bus was honestly one of the worst moments of my life, like this proper oh no moment that I've never have repeated before or since. I just feel bad for girls who don't have anyone to run to when something like that happens, girls who aren't as lucky as me, who don't get to go home, sometimes, ever again. I had just finished my first year of university and had taken up a position as a taxi dispatcher with my boyfriend's cousin's taxi company. 
For the first week and a half, I worked mainly day shifts until the owner decided to extend the hours to 24-7, and I was the lucky employee who would be covering three of the four of these shifts a week. The next week I was working my first night shift alone. The driver would be out all night looking for fares which meant a lot of the night would be just me. I wasn't uneasy working such a shift by myself since I had worked at a 24 hour coffee shop and was used to midnight shifts. It was also a Wednesday or Thursday night so it wasn't very busy. The best part about this job was that my boss let me use the internet to play video games on my laptop in the office. From the computer desk in the office I could see the front door, a portion of the front desk and most of the front windows so I could keep a close eye on what was happening outside. Plus the bell above the door always alerted me to a new customer so I couldn't be caught off guard if I got too into my game. On this particular night, I was working with a taxi driver named Dave. Dave is about 6 foot 3 and 300 pounds, plus he suffers from severe health problems one of which made all of his movements slow and painful. He definitely wasn't Mr. Fitness or the type of person who would be able to defend himself or others very easily. Sometime during the early hours of the morning, around 1.30 to 2 a.m., Dave gets a call to go pick up someone in the town about 15 minutes away. He gathered up his stuff and drove into the night while I headed into the office and continued playing my video game. About 15 minutes later, I caught something over the top of my laptop. My mind froze. I could hear panting, and in the reflection of the window, I could see someone sitting in one of the waiting chairs. I walked to the doorway that connects the front room with the office. I glanced into the sitting area and nearly shit bricks. Some guy with a massive rat tail had managed to ninja his way into the office and was now sitting in one of the chairs with his face buried in his hands, panting heavily. He was dirty, sweaty, and sounded like he had just run a marathon. Now, the rat tail should have tipped me off, but I found it more hilarious than frightening. A few moments passed and I finally built up the courage to ask him if he needed a cab. He didn't respond at first. I asked him again, and he looks up at me. I took a step back into the office. His face was scratched and covered in blood from the wound on the top of his head. I was shocked and immediately offered assistance to him. He replies with, I'm fine. I don't need no help. I just want to go home. I asked him if he needed a cab and, if so, where he was going. He told me he lives about 20 minutes away and wants Dave to take him home. After that, shit started to get weird. I called over to Dave using the radio to tell him that there was a fare in the office and that he wanted a ride. He told me he'd be another 10 minutes or so. My hand was on the phone the entire time in case this guy made any sudden movements. Instead of going back into the office, I decided it was best to stay out front where there are two great big bay windows that make it easy to see what is happening inside the taxi office. I didn't feel as though he was a threat at all but he seemed really angry at something, so I wanted to make sure that if something happened to me, people would be able to see it. So I walked out into the front room, and as I get closer to the gentleman, that's when I see it. He's not just bleeding from the head, but from the shoulder and knee. I asked him again if he's okay, and then I offered to call an ambulance for him. Bad idea. You don't need to be doing that, he told me. It ain't like I killed nobody, right? I never killed nobody. Don't go doing that. You don't need to call anyone. I just want to go home. I'm sorry. I just noticed that you're bleeding pretty badly and thought maybe you'd like someone to make sure you're okay. I replied. I didn't kill nobody. That asshole should have kept his mouth shut. He had what was coming to him. He shouldn't have said those things. But it ain't like I killed nobody. You don't need to call nobody. I just want to go home. Okay, I tell him. But you're bleeding. It ain't like I killed nobody, he replied. I swear I didn't kill nobody. Please don't call the cops. I don't need the cops. I just need to go home. I didn't kill anyone. Silence for a few minutes. He notices the phone clutched in my hand. I fell down, he blurted out. 
pardon? I fell, he repeated. That's why I'm bleeding. I fell. It ain't like I killed nobody. He suddenly got up and started pacing. He was growing impatient for his cab, and I was scared shitless. Blood was now on the chair and floor. I had the phone in my hand, and every once in a while he broke the silence with another string of incoherent babbling about how he had done nothing wrong because he hadn't killed anyone, and that I didn't need to call the cops because he was a good guy. Eventually Dave radios over that he's about two minutes away, and I breathe a sigh of relief. He pulled up out front. The man gets into the car and they drive off. Now I'm worried for Dave, so I call the cops. I reported what happened, and they followed the taxi cab to this guy's house where they arrested him. Turns out this guy had run away from a nearby bar after he had physically assaulted a fellow patron. To what extent, I never found out. He injured him with a sharp object, I assume a pocket knife or needle, took off running, fell and managed to find his way to the taxi office. During his time in the cab office, the police had been searching for him, so technically no, he didn't kill anyone, but he did assault and attempt to murder someone. I also found out that one of the other drivers, Stephen, knew the guy from high school years ago. His name is Duke, which explains the rat tail, and he has a history of violence. He also has a history of coming home drunk and cracking his wife's skull open from time to time. Whether he had planned to that night, I couldn't say, but I'm just glad that the guy ended up in the drunk tank for the night. His wife was unharmed, and the guy who got stabbed apparently didn't die. At least, I assume he didn't, since I still see Duke every now and then walking the streets with his glorious rat tail, which means he didn't get arrested. But in all seriousness, I wish you guys could have seen this rat tail. That thing was impressive. It was winter 2012, and I was 18 or 19 at the time. I was working in a petrol station in an average-sized town in England. It was an okay job, good money for somebody who was at college at the time, and it was just a shame it was a weekend job. So while my friends were getting drunk and having fun, I was in a petrol station serving taxi drivers and the occasional drunk. It started off like any other night. Serve people, clean up, do stock, the average night shift work. Since it was winter, the night was really dark and you could only see faint outlines of people walking back and forth even with street lights. The place where I worked was situated across the road from a pub and had an alley running beside it that led to a housing estate. Around 3 to 4 a.m. as I finished cleaning a set of shelves, I noticed a figure standing in the alley just out of the light but just enough to hide his face but you could make out his clothing. I initially brushed it off as somebody waiting for a taxi as it seemed harmless enough. I sat down in my chair behind the counter and looked at my phone and played some games for a bit. When I looked up it was 5am and he was still there, waiting, watching me. To make my situation worse, after 5 there was hardly any traffic or passerbys. I had that guttural feeling that he had some harmful intent. I was safe, however, as I locked in till the morning. I stared back in a trance trying to keep an eye on whatever he would do next. After a while I needed to use the toilet so I went and came back thinking that he might have walked off. But he didn't. He was still there. I then decided not to do my last job until my coworker came in to start their shift as my last job was to take out the fire extinguishers and sand buckets. It got to be about 6 a.m. The figure faded back into the alley, and I didn't see him for the rest of the shift. When my coworker arrived, it was still dark, and I usually walked the 10 minutes back home, but I got a taxi home after that shift. I felt that the guy could be anywhere, still watching me. I told my coworkers and family members about my experience, and they said they personally haven't experienced anything like it and wouldn't like to either. I was very nervous when doing my shifts from then on, 
feeling like as soon as I let my guard down, he would strike, but thankfully nothing else happened after that. I quit the following summer to go to university. My first real job was working at a gas station when I was just 17 years old. The station itself was this run-down old building just outside of Mount Vernon, Illinois, well off the beaten path. The owners barely cleaned the place and were too cheap to maintain anything other than the gas pumps. The ceiling leaked. The entire rear room was a mess and the employee's bathroom barely worked. It was like it was screaming out to me, Hey kid, don't work here, it sucks. But what can I say? I needed the money. What's worse, the other two members of staff were some of the creepiest people I'd ever met. I strongly suspected one of them was a meth head, but I never get proof on that. But I literally know the other dude had been to prison for manslaughter. I mean, I never asked him about it. I'm not that stupid. But between you and me, if his personality was anything to go by, he must have had a pretty good lawyer to have gotten off with just a manslaughter conviction. But surprisingly... The scariest thing I ever experienced while working there wasn't anything to do with either of them. It actually involved my worst and most irrational fear. So my least favorite part of the job was taking out the trash at the end of a graveyard shift. Every single time I did it, I used to get the creeps thinking something was going to burst out of the dumpster and grab me, then drag me down to the garbage room or something. That, or how someone might be waiting for me, crouched among the trash bags and I'd never see them until it was too late. Like I said, just one of those dumb, irrational fears you get when doing something all alone and late at night. But then this one night, I walk out the rear exit, full trash bag in hand when I hear, Hey you! I freeze, turning to see nothing in the parking lot but a few sleeper trucks. It didn't help that it was almost pitch black out there and I realized I can't see who's apparently talking to me. I start to get really nervous. I'm too anxious to say anything and I simply start heading back inside when I hear it again. Hey. Hey you. Someone was definitely calling out to me while also trying to remain as quiet as possible. It was the trying to stay quiet part that really gave me the willies. No one whose intentions are innocent talks like that. Not usually anyway. My gut is just telling me, this is bad. This is really bad and I'm smart enough to listen to it. The last thing I heard before I got back to safety was like, Hey, hey, wait a minute, come here. Then I just shut the door, bolted, then started to close up for the evening. Instead of driving back, I called my dad and told him some sketchy guy was hanging around the parking lot and that I was scared. So, being the great father he was, he drove down to make sure I was safe and to give me a ride home, leaving my car in the parking lot until the next day. The following morning I get a call from the manager telling me I don't have to go into work that afternoon. When I ask why, she tells me that about 15 minutes after my dad showed up to give me a ride home, a bunch of guys smashed their way into the gas station and basically ransacked the place. When I told him about the guy whispering to me in the parking lot, he just about freaked out, thanking God that I was okay and that they'd timed their raid around closing. Obviously I was relieved too. Like they totally smashed the place up, so if I'd been there, there's no telling what they would have done to me. But that wasn't what had my manager freaking out so much. It was the fact that the cops had told him how lucky I was. Because this same gang had committed a bunch of other robberies in the area, and this was the only one in which they hadn't taken a hostage of some kind. One store owner was beaten half to death after he refused to tell them where his safe was. Turned out he didn't have one. He just took all his cash home with him every night. Trouble was, they didn't buy that story and he ended up in the hospital for like a month. That could have been me. Really, it could have. And given that I was a 17 year old girl at the time it happened, Jesus, I can't even imagine how rough I'd have had it. After that, my dad refused to let me work the graveyard shift. And I can't say I was too sore about that at all. This happened back when I was 14, but even with my bad memory, I remember this years later. 
I honestly think that this memory will haunt me for the rest of my life. I would often go walking either alone or with my neighbor, Jem, but this specific night she didn't go out with me. I usually went walking at around 9 at night, but was impatient that night, so I left about 15 minutes early. It was summer in Texas, but I grabbed my black hoodie anyways. The reason for this was because I was a pretty small kid, even for my age, and I would walk with a knife in my sleeve in case of a problem. There was security in this area, but they were pretty much useless and weren't fond of the kids anyways, so wearing black was to avoid them seeing me and to maybe help avoid being noticed by anyone else too. The area was heavily wooded and the roads had no street lights. I had lived there my whole life though, so with the moonlight this wasn't really an issue. I could see things as much as I needed to. I walked to the park in the area and sat down on the swing set like I had a million times before. The park was old and wasn't very well taken care of, so the swing set creaked. The wooden picnic tables were half rotted with the paint mostly peeled away, and the metal slide was covered in rust. There was the main road that ran in front of the park and a branch off road that ran along the side of the park with a thin line of trees between the side road and park. After a while, a favorite song of mine came on and I, of course, started singing to it, since singing was a big way I let out stress despite my stage fright. I had a tendency to not hold back when singing at this park since there was rarely people near it during the day, let alone at night. My blood ran cold though when I saw the shape of a person maybe 50 to 100 feet in front of me on the main road. The main reason for the chill was the fear that this random person heard me sing. But then I got a deeper, bad feeling. Something was just wrong about them. I noticed that the person was walking fast, really fast, almost at running speed. I figured he might have been running from something or after something, but when I looked around everywhere that I could possibly see from where I was, I saw nothing else but them. They soon passed by the park, not seeming to notice me, and after a few minutes of waiting to make sure that they were gone, I continued singing. After a couple of more songs, I decided that it was time to go home. I still had that bad feeling, that uneasy pit in my stomach that you get when you're being watched. I even thought that I saw something behind the tree line beside the side road and the swings, but I brushed that off as an animal or something. Deer were really common, so were dogs and things, so it was probably me getting spooked by an animal again. But the feeling was eating away at me, so I cut my usual 30 minute to an hour walk to about 10 minutes. So I got up and started to leave the park, turning onto the main road to go home. As I was leaving, I saw a person walking towards the main road from the road that I ran right along the park. It looked like the same person as before. It was clearly a man. He must have been visiting a friend or something, right? Even if that was the case, I crossed the opposite side of the street so I wouldn't pass directly by him. He didn't look particularly dangerous or unusual, so sadly no weird creepy homeless looking man for this story. I just got a bad feeling from him, which is probably what makes him even more terrifying. He got to the intersection before me and stopped. I passed by and glanced at the man, taking in what details I could under the moonlight that came from between the tree branches. He looked normal. He was probably an average height, wearing a pure white ball cap with no logos that cast a shadow over his face and a pure white polo type shirt. There wasn't a speck of dirt on the man. He looked well kept and it made the moonlight almost shine on him like he was some kind of ghost which just added to my uneasy feeling. He clearly wasn't out there to be exercising or anything like that. He watched me as I passed by and I tried to pretend that I didn't notice. I would occasionally look around as if though I was just looking at the woods so I could see the man out of my peripheral vision. I didn't want or need to see the man in detail, partly because I was scared of the possibility of seeing something else too. Just because the man was much larger than me didn't mean that he wasn't probably armed as well. Once I was around 15 feet past the intersection, I did one of these glances and my stomach dropped as I saw him turn and start to follow me. Maybe he was just going for an extra long walk or something, right? He probably isn't following me, right? Then another thought popped in my mind and it sent my stomach to my feet. I'd been there for probably 10 minutes or so singing after he passed. What if he wasn't visiting anyone? What if he was the thing I saw just beyond the tree line? That's kind of obvious now that that was almost definitely the case, but let's be fair. 
When do 14 year olds ever think through all the details of a situation completely during the situation? He was probably watching me the whole time. He could have snuck up and done God knows what at any time. I kept doing my glances and noticed that he was getting closer and closer. I gripped my knife tighter ready in case I had to use it. The chance of it going well wasn't the best, but it was a better chance than not trying at all. But I wanted that to be a last ditch option. I tried to make sure it wasn't obvious that I was keeping tabs on him. I didn't want him getting anxious and having him decide to speed up whatever plan it was. I was only halfway home and this was before I had surgery on my ankle so I was absolutely sure that he could catch me before I'd reach the house if I started running where I was so that wasn't an option whatsoever. I didn't have many current options though so the one I chose was to bide my time till an opportunity opened up. I kept walking at a rather quick but unpanicked pace, keeping tabs on the man as he inched closer and kept an eye out for opportunities. And an opportunity came and it felt like it was sent from God himself. I saw headlights. A car was rolling towards me at a careful pace like normal considering the animals I mentioned earlier. It was Jem's death. I recognized the shape of the lights and as the car got closer I became convinced it was him. I was never so relieved to see that tiny white car. I tried signaling him without letting the man know that I was, but he just passed by. He must have thought I was just saying hi. I glanced back again. Even though he didn't stop, he did exactly what I needed. He did slow down a bit as he passed. The man backed up a lot and crossed to the other side of the road. The headlights were on him and he couldn't see me at least for around 5 or 6 seconds, maybe a bit longer including readjusting to the dark. I walked faster. I didn't run, that way my steps wouldn't be too loud, but I rounded the corner before he'd be able to readjust and get sight of me again. Once I could turn and no longer see him, I rushed home and locked the door. I knew better than to leave it unlocked since after all, I lived in the woods. Just because I couldn't see him anymore didn't mean that he wasn't nearby and didn't mean he couldn't see me. As stupid as this next part is, it's probably for the best that I did it. I texted Jem. I asked her to meet me outside right now because something happened and I needed to come over. She said okay and we both went outside and as soon as I saw her in the driveway I sprinted to her house. I didn't want to be outside any longer than I had to be. She kept panicking and asked what happened and what was wrong and once I caught my breath I told her everything. Right after I got done explaining, her dad walked in the house. He looked at Jem, seeming worried then noticed me hiding behind her. He looked relieved and told her, I was about to tell you to ask her to come over here. I asked him if he saw the man following me, and he said in the affirmative. He didn't really see his face, but that it was looking like he was trying to make it look like he was on a phone when he wasn't holding anything. But that wasn't even close to the worst part. I think this was the first time I've seen this man scared, and I'm not sure if I've ever seen fear like this from him since. He told us the man wasn't alone. There was a gate at the front of where I live that needed a car to get in. Apparently there was another man outside the gate who looked similar to the first standing by a van. That meant they didn't live there, didn't want security knowing they were there, and wanted to get out quickly and quietly after they did whatever they were there for. Needless to say, I spent that night at Jem's that night, and I have no clue what would have happened had Jem's dad not driven by or if I would have left at my normal time. I was 17 in the 11th grade. I usually didn't accept random requests on my Instagram, especially if we had no mutuals. I took my page off private for a while and so anyone could follow me. This is when I got a notification that he started following me. The page had a normal following. Not small enough to question whether it was a fake account or not. He had multiple pictures of himself with friends and family with captions and all. His comments were off for all of his posts, which wasn't a red flag since I had mine off too. Immediately after following me, he went through my profile and liked all of my pictures. He was a fit, good looking guy, so I was flattered. Not long after, he DM'd me replying to a story of mine asking me if I was from such and such a city and that he was from there too. 
We immediately hit it off and DM non-stop for a while. It didn't feel forced and we never ran out of things to talk about. We eventually swapped phone numbers and started texting. He told me he was studying at a really good university which was in a city two hours away from where we both lived. Our talks escalated to day-to-day -day phone calls which lasted for hours. I sincerely started growing feelings for him and he made it clear he felt the same for me. We would talk about our deepest insecurities, our past, what we wanted our futures to look like, etc. It had been about two months of talking and I was undeniably eager to meet up in person. He would tell me he was coming to visit home on the weekend, but would always come up with an excuse as to why he couldn't make it. He gave very convincing and detailed excuses, never vague so I didn't question it. I hadn't told any friends about him until my best friend and I had a sleepover. I ended up telling her about him, showed her his pictures, and didn't leave out that we hadn't met yet. Wanting to look out for me, she suggested I ask him to video chat to make sure he is who he says he is before meeting up. She told me she didn't want to freak me out, but that she was sure that she had seen his pictures on Tumblr before. There's a tool on Google that can be used to locate social media accounts and articles where the pictures have been posted. While she was at that, I called him and asked him if he was home and alone before asking him to video chat so he couldn't make up an excuse on the spot. He said he was home and alone but couldn't video chat because of his weak internet connection. My heart sank into my stomach. The possibility of being catfished was not far-fetched anymore. I quickly downloaded WhatsApp because I remember him telling me he spoke to his parents on it. Before doing that, my friend showed me the results of what she found, which devastated me to my core. The man in the pictures was a French model and singer. We found the exact pictures of that POS used on his catfish profile and actual verified Instagram account. My devastation turned into anger, then turned into absolute disgust and revulsion when I saw his profile picture on WhatsApp. He was evidently much older than he claimed he was, probably in his 30s, a complete different race than what he portrayed to be, lied about being a university student, etc. P.S. I have no preference to what comes to race or nationality, but he literally lied to me in detail about being part Italian and part Colombian. He even made up an excuse as to why he didn't speak Italian or Spanish when he claimed he frequently visited back home. I wanted to crawl into a hole and die. I started to sob uncontrollably and confronted him on WhatsApp. He went on to explain how he came across my profile and wanted desperately to get to know me. He said I knew I wouldn't be interested in who he actually is and wouldn't be attracted to him so instead he used his fake account, which he was already using and active on prior to come across my profile. He said he came close to coming clean multiple times but was afraid of how I would react. He said even though his persona was fake, everything else was genuine. It turned out that he was a 31-year-old mechanic and living with his parents. He even confessed to driving to my neighborhood, finding my high school and following me around as I went about my day. I blocked him off WhatsApp then he quickly started texting my number begging me not to block that too and to give him a chance to explain things face to face. I went on to block him on everything, feeling absolutely heartbroken and betrayed while doing so. I spent months of my life daydreaming and fantasizing about how it would be like when we finally met in person and where it would go from there, grew genuine feelings for him and even considered applying for the same university he was supposedly studying at. I got over it eventually, but I've definitely grown to be very paranoid and distrusting when it comes to meeting people online. I'm happily married now, but I wonder what would have happened if he and I met in person and the consequences I would have faced for being so naive and oblivious. Back when I was still a senior in high school, me and my mom went on a trip to the movies. It was this regular mother-daughter bonding ritual we used to have. Catch a movie, critique it, and then hit up the Bob Evans next door for dinner. We'd always pick up my dad something in a takeout box too, and I really miss those days. But anyway, we have our food and drive home, just like we always did, and the rest of the night was uneventful. But the next morning, I wake up to a Facebook friend request from a name I didn't recognize. Thinking it might have been a mutual, I just accept it, but then like five minutes later, 
I got a message from the same account that says something like, Hey, I know this might sound a little weird, but I saw you at the Bob Evans last night and I wondered if you might like to go out sometime. So I'm like, huh, how did someone figure out my name? Did they overhear my mom say it or something? Like I get it was polite, but it still creeped me out. Why would you go to those lengths to find me? And he must have been looking for hours. Immediately, there's all these red flags, so I had no intention of accepting his invitation, but at the same time, I didn't want to be a jerk to him. So I messaged him back like, Hi, yeah, I was there, but I'm actually kind of seeing someone right now, and I don't think they'd be too happy if we went out. At first, their reply was encouraging, and they seemed to take it on the chin. They say like, Ah, that sucks. Sorry if this is awkward now. I respond, No, don't worry. You didn't know. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend, though. It was a close-ended reply, you know. The kind that's designed to just end the conversation. Next thing, he starts typing, and I figured he's going to just carry on being gentlemanly, creepily direct, but gentlemanly, I suppose. But, no. There's this very subtle shift in his tone when he says, I just figured, since I went to all this effort to find you, you might give me a chance. This is where I saw a kind of, well, opportunity. I had literally zero clue how this guy had found me, and I didn't like the idea that just anyone could look me up online no matter how innocent their intentions were. So I straight up asked him, how did you find me? He starts typing, and stopping, typing, and stopping, and I can tell he's thinking of the right way to phrase it. Then he says something like, where there's a will, there's a way. I can find anyone online. It's easy. When I set my mind to something, I achieve it. Is your current boyfriend an overachiever like that? I distinctly remember him using that term, overachiever, and was honestly so cringe. If I wasn't put off before, I certainly was then. But still, I wanted to find out how this creep had managed to track me down. So I might have done something stupid to get him to talk and said, honestly no, and it's kind of hot that you're so smart and stuff. So, how did you do it? He responds, I was the one who swiped your mom's card, he replied. So, a liar too. He wasn't some hacker. He just worked at the Bob Evans. So yeah, he probably had overheard my name, then just matched it up with the name of my mom's card. Then bingo, he finds me on Facebook. I had to hold back from just letting loose on this guy, but... It if he was that much of a psycho, then I figured it was better to not make him mad. Ah, sneaky. I like it, I replied. But like I said, kinda seeing someone right now, so thanks, but no thanks. Bye. I mute the conversation, but don't block the guy or unfriend him or anything. See, making him mad I was worried about. Then I just go about the rest of my day. Yeah, I told all my friends how creepy it was, and I casually suggested to my mom we pick a new food venue for our post-movie dinners. But other than that, I just went about my day as usual. It's kind of weird how this pattern repeated itself. The first time I'm asleep, blissfully ignorant that some creep is plugging my name into Facebook, probably to perv at my display picture. The second time I had him on mute, so I had no idea what was going on in that little message thread. It wasn't until later on that night that I opened my messenger on my phone and actually saw the little 44 notification count next to his name that I realized he'd sent me other messages. And yes, it did say 44. He'd sent 44 different messages, mostly rants, and he'd been sending them on and off all day. But it wasn't until I actually read what they said that I started to freak out. I'm not going to type up everything I remember him saying, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you will be able to guess the majority of it. Think nice guy style put downs coupled with threats of actual violence. He basically said that if he'd managed to track me down online in a few hours, imagine what he could learn by the end of the week. He said he had friends that would help him break into our house. After that, they'd tie my parents up, kill them in front of me then take turns abusing me until I was used up and lifeless. And that's the clean version of it, condensed into two sentences. 44 different lengthy messages he sent me. Think about that. 
The final message I read, it went on. Before I ran downstairs to tell my mom and dad was the message that read, I'm in my car and I'm looking for your house. I didn't know he was just trying to scare me, so I was crying as dad called the cops. The guy ended up getting arrested for the threats he made, and I know he got fired from the Bob Evans because my mom kicked up a stink about it after the arrest. I never saw the guy again, so I'm thinking it was a case of his bark being louder than his bite. But I know that there are other women out there who aren't so lucky, and their stalkers are much more willing to get up close and personal. I just hope we can one day live in a world where men don't act all predatory and creepy with women they like. Like it's so counterintuitive to what we want in a man. I wish they just understand that. But till then, I suppose all we can do is be safer online and with dating apps and hope we never run into that one sick psychopath that won't take no for an answer. Our official merch store is finally here. If you want to support more of our channel, check out our merch shop. The link is in the description down below. See you on the next video.